to inspiring affinity. Welcome to inspiring affinity. Welcome to inspiring affinity. Discovering the work of Nikola Tesla changed my life. The more I experimented with this lost science, the more one name kept coming up over and over again. Eric Dollard was the only one to recreate Tesla's key experiments with a new type of electricity. He even made videos. While everyone else never took Tesla past Frankenstein movies and Halloween parties, Eric Dollard had re-engineered the Tesla coils and written papers and equations. They worked. Where was Eric Dollard? What was he up to? How far had he gone? The good news. Eric was still alive and publishing. The bad news, Eric had all his labs taken from him and was living out of his car in the Mojave Desert. Time for action. Eric would not meet the same fate as Tesla, not on my watch. I set up a fundraiser and I wrote Eric a letter. Yes, real paper and ink. Eric wrote back. It was time to meet Eric Dollard. You're afraid of his potential. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's inherent in electricity to free everything. Free everything. <laughs> <laughs> they want to put everything satellites. They really want to get rid of all radio. They do. They do. They want to get rid of all radio. Why? It's too free. Too free. Yeah. You can't, uh, it's too hard to regulate, particularly high-frequency radio. Anybody, you know, with a PRC-47, like in my car, can, you know, talk to anybody in the world. But RCA wanted a new system, and that's what it would turn out to be. Long after RCA died, that's what it turned out to be. I didn't know that then, and they didn't know that then. I was just gonna, well, the most likely guy to figure out something new. They already knew from supporting my high school experiments and, le and letting me use the station for my own purposes, they knew that I was the guy that was gonna come up with something new out of all the old junk. Because I was already doing stuff in the laboratory that nobody could even explain. I didn't know, they didn't know, nobody knew what it was gonna be. I didn't even know who Tesla was, nor did they. time to go to Wardenclyffe. That's what RCA wanted in the beginning anyway. But by then, by 1990, I had that all figured out. You had Wardenclyffe all figured out in 1990? Yeah. I was ready to implement it. And that was the place to do it, and that's what the states, that's what KPH needed. Needed a new way to talk to ships at sea. Using Tesla technology. Using Tesla technology. Or Alex Anderson, or both. Or improved, yeah. That's what so I was going to start with the basic, uh, you know, the basic uh, Tesla transformer. I have built an experimental model. It was, I was all ready for the first test to the receiving station up to Point Reyes. They were laughing about the way the air is going to transmit to the through the ground to the receiving station. <laughs> the, the station manager was anxiously waiting. You know, and I showed the test of the transformer, you know, and its ability, you know, to light fluorescent lamps, at, you know, without any power loss. That kind of blew the transmitter tech away. You know, the thing, the amp meter showed it was definitely transmitting in the station ground. You know, I had a little RF milliamp meter, and it was putting, you know, there's current going in the station ground. So the thing was to do it outside the shielded room of the station and, and do it out on the Alexanderson antenna thing and then have the guys up at the receiving station see what level they picked it up. And then go, then go down to 500 kilocycles and do it to ships at sea. Did you get a chance to finish this? No, no, MCI uh, boarded the station and tried to wreck it. It was for ship to shore. Ship to shore. Ship to shore. Can't they communicate now? From with ship yeah, but this doesn't have the delay or the attenuation. So how would it improve in performance? Yeah, and the receiver would run off the transmitter. Okay, going that's the that's the Tesla's idea. Is the receiver runs off the transmitter, it doesn't require any source of power, and the signal doesn't fade, and it doesn't weaken with distance. So it 
it would work anywhere in the Pacific. And there'd be, though, but the way that place is geologically set up and, and the grounds that are already there and the Tesla system, I expect the signal would be just, just as strong in China as it was off the coast of San Francisco. So, and there probably would be no time delay, or the time delay would be much less than the propagation of light. So it would significantly improve this. So because that's the ground terminal into the earth. It was selected for that by Marconi. That's the Indians call it the hole in the sky. They went there and electrified them, and then they ran away from it. They wouldn't live there. So it was sacred to them. Yeah, it's it's a it's a uh, it's kind of like a ley line runs through there. The whole geology around there concentrates on this spot. It's like all the trees are lined up with it, and everything focuses on where that building sits. Wow. So according to the Marconi guys, there was five energy spots on the planet that were originally selected to try to build a global system, and Bolinas was one of the most important ones. Talk to ships at sea doesn't sound too exciting, and can't we already do that? What does this have to do with Wardenclyffe? Wardenclyffe was a project to transmit electricity and radio with minimal losses over vast distances through the earth and the ocean. What the ever modest and cautious Eric Dollard is doing by talking about ships at sea is offering his version of Wardenclyffe as a service to the U.S. Navy while not incurring the wrath of the oil companies. There's a reason Eric Dollard has stayed alive this long. Eric Dollard's version of Wardenclyffe is even more advanced than Nikola Tesla's as it will allow the sending of radio and electricity at faster than light speeds through the earth to any point on the earth or sea with absolutely no losses. By placing it on a powerful ley line like at Bolinas KPH, it will even synthesize and magnify the energy on the way, exceeding even what Tesla had imagined. Not bad for an old guy living in the desert. came up with something new that nobody, not Alex Anderson or Tesla, had ever come up with. I raised it to the next level. I was able to make it broadband. It was, it was a, a general laboratory and, and facility in, in antenna-type communications of all different forms, all different frequencies, from microwaves all the way down to, to audio. The whole idea was, was, was to have the broadest, most generalized receiving capability possible. In other words, the ultimate receiver. Two days before they happened, what it, it, it worked twice for two earthquakes. Which one? Northridge and Landers. I got the same thing from Japan two days before the giant Japan earthquake. Fukushima. Yeah, I picked it all the way up in Landers. One hour before the first earthquake, and uh, two, that was about two days before the main event. Because it, it would go off 18 hours before a major earthquake. Alert concert hall. Oh, it would just go wild. Well, different signals, different places seem different sounds. Here it was the sounds of screaming, screaming sounds. Scream. First it starts with ricocheting bullets. And then uh, they get snappier or more like steel wires being hit. And then uh, they get stronger until eventually it's like whole dumpster loads of beer bottles being dumped on uh, metal decks of ships or something, smashing. And it, it just builds up a sharper and sharper pitch until eventually the thing basically just freaks. It's like almost like a sine wave. It's about uh, 12 hours before the blast. The blast. Yeah, 6.5 or greater earthquake. At the Alexanderson received <coughs> from the interior of the earth. And then there was a, what's called a beverage, that's another RCA inventor, beverage. 
was an overground antenna that received from the ionosphere. And then the whole system was stereo. So on the, uh, the, the audition system, the right-hand channel was underground and the left-hand channel was overground. So you could pick up stereo in two different dimensions. It all depends what's going on. Lightning storms or, you know, earthquakes, tornadoes, solar flares. The musical sounds come from inside the earth. Otherwise, you have to drill that hole. You have to drill a hundred foot deep hole and then you have to make an electrolytic uh, uh, electrode to go down that hole and make contact with the soil around it. And you can never do it as good as a plant can, because that's the whole plant's way of life. It's grounding. <laughs> In fact, I have a whole description of the system on the internet. It's called, it's called System for the Transmission and Reception of Telluric Electric Waves. It's about 20 pages. It gives a complete description of my whole telluric ionospheric transmission concept in the form of a, of a patent statement. So you willingly gave it to the public because you yeah, want well, this Yeah, well, good luck letting them figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Not one book. That's what that capitalist mentality does. It causes these people to hoard their stuff off in the corner, you know, and just spit at everybody and, and not tell anybody what's going on. Then it all gets lost. You know, Steinmetz was the other way around. They would force him not to write things in his book. Well, Steinmetz is the hero. <laughs> Describe him. He's the guy. He's a he's a deformed, a hunchback dwarf. <laughs> like Igor from Frankenstein. Igor from Frankenstein. Yeah. Was Igor actually based on? Yeah, him? that was Steinmetz. And who was Doctor Frankenstein? Tesla. <laughs> Just to convince people of the horrors of electricity, it was kind of holdover from you know the Edison uh, electrocuting circus animal days. What was the Frankenstein monster? Who was he? No, that's, that's present-day technology. <laughs> he took all the crap out of the mathematics. He, he de-euroed it. And they didn't like him for that. So any engineer could understand. That yeah, that was the whole idea. And it was like... And that's how Alex Anderson came about. Alex Anderson immigrated all the way from Sweden just to work with Steinmetz when he was 18 years old. Another He's the guy that invented that all that stuff at RCA, the uh, you know the uh, the radio frequency stuff, the Alexanderson antenna. There's no mathematical analysis available for any of this stuff. There's no way to express it analytically. But, but I not. came up with a way to do it out of Steinmetz's method. What do you call your method? It's called the Verser method. Ver yeah. What was Steinmetz's and, and, and everything has to be expressed in, in four terms rather than two. Ah. That's the problem. Because you can't solve an algebraic expression higher than second degree. And mine were all fourth and eighth. This stuff takes a long time to put together. 45 years? All by myself. With all, yeah, with all broken equipment pulled out of junkyards. While working on another job. Well, and I had to pay for it <laughs> on top of that. And you did it. Yeah. And then somebody fucked it all up <laughs> when it was done. We're going to fix that, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> But then they threw me out of the house, so what good was it to have the laboratory there? So, you know, it all got taken apart and never got put together again. 
So then RCA started providing the bigger stuff, and then I built the big laboratory in San Francisco, and then about the time that was done, it got destroyed. By who? By the real estate swines. They raised the rent from eight cents a square foot to a dollar a square foot when Feinstein became mayor. Ah, uh, raising the rent, that's the oldest yeah, way. Right. And then they send the hoodlums in to smash and steal all your stuff, and the police don't do anything about it. That was your second lab? That was, uh, that was at, uh, my first outside my parents' lab. Okay, so it was your second real lab. Yeah. So, you so lost I that? tried to reconfigure, you know, another number, a number of other places, and uh, all the equipment got looted and disappeared, no matter where I moved it, and then Commonweal smashed the rest of it out at RCA. So I moved to Sonoma State, and after four years, it was the same thing. The administration changed, and they closed the radio station down and everything, and all the equipment was all those RCA receivers and all that stuff was lost forever. All the RCA books, the original papers by their scientists, and everything was all lost. It's like that. How many years So then work? I get in the Marconi building and put a whole thing back together again with David, you know, starting out of his bedroom, and that took damn near a year to put together, and when it was done, then the doors were slammed on me, and the equipment all disappeared, and that was all lost. What number of lab was that, third or fourth? Oh, I don't know. There's just, you know, there's all the little ones in between, too. They were all lost. That's yeah, or whatever, you know, car or ship or, or whatever other thing. It's all, everything's all gone. All of it. Well, I'm always alone. I'm in solitary confinement here. I have, there, there's no people in my life. I'm here in solitary confinement in infinity with nothing to do in my car. You know, I go back to the old Hollywood movies and I see the horse, you know, with the guy sitting on the idyllic scene exactly where my car is parked while I'm watching the movie downtown. <laughs> <laughs> It gives you another feeling about the place you live when you see it in all these Hollywood Western movies, you know, and they're portraying your rat hole as, you know, the idyllic scene when man conquered the West, you know, with the chorus in the background and the whole thing, and that happens to be your rat hole where you live. I was in grammar school oh, one day a year. It was Eric Day. <laughs> at your grammar school? Yeah. And then I'd drag whatever monstrosity I had contrived at home, and then the school janitor would have to come and certify that it was safe to plug into the wall outlet. You know, he didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then goodness. the bully got to get shocked. The teacher would force it to happen and make a mockery out of him in front of the entire class, and then the rest of the year he wasn't a bully. And how many he was volts? the guy that would get bit. How many kilowatt hours? Well, you know, I, I made sure to keep it, you know, less than like five milliamps or, you know, ten. Just, you know, about like getting slugged by a baseball bat. But it's not <laughs> nothing to really, you know, do any damage to your body. It scares you more than anything. <laughs> Can't, I don't know my right from left. I can't tie my shoelaces. So the yeah, so they have the captain's inspection. Of course, I fail. You know, so the, the captain curses me and the whole thing, and I'm thrown out of line and all that. Well, that's fine. I'll have to... So I go back to work in the building. The executive officer is a Marine Corps. He's a uh, lieutenant colonel. And they're nasty. So I try to go back in the building, and he st stands in front of me. And he looks at me and he goes, Dollard, you are a slob. <laughs> and then he goes, but you do such damn good work, get back inside. <laughs> My thing is to try to get all this back together as fast as possible. I don't like being without it. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen, God willing. If the people get behind you, if they know what you're trying to do and yeah. why it's important. Why should they be interested in it? Maybe they have dreams too, just like you.
we have dream empathy. When people we like and admire have dreams similar to ours, that could help ours, we want to help them. We can see. <laughs> Ever pessimistic Mr. Dollard, except when he has to build something, then he knows it's going to work. <laughs> but not much belief in his fellow humans. Can we prove him wrong? With what? <laughs> Eric Dollard is the last link we have to a lost age of science, an age that began in ancient Egypt, flourished in Greece among Pythagoras, was exemplified in the cosmology of Kepler, the music of Bach, taken to its experimental pinnacle by Nikola Tesla, and made into reality by the math of Steinmetz. The entire technological world we now live in is a highly degraded form of what this technology was intended to be, a technology that is more ancient than new, and more natural than technology at all. Nikola Tesla ended his days impoverished and died alone in his hotel room, only to have the truth about his work suppressed, even today. The very same forces that banished Tesla are doing the same thing now to Eric Dollard. They have exiled him solitary confinement in the desert. They have destroyed all his laboratories, and with them, 45 years of his work. Yet, they have not broken his spirit, nor will they, for he is made of far sterner stuff. This time, it is going to be different. We are a dedicated group of scientists, engineers, and believers in the power of the human spirit. We need you to join us in our quest to bring this great gift to humanity. A gift that will change all the rules. Every great wizard needs warriors to protect him while working his magic. This means you. Then it was time to go to Warden Cliff. But by then, by 1990, I had that all figured out. That's, that's the Tesla's idea. As the receiver runs off the transmitter, it doesn't require any source of power. And the signal doesn't fade. And it doesn't weaken with distance. It's inherent in electricity to free everything. They want to get rid of all radium. Why? It's too free. But obviously, the people that invented the whole thing had a different idea how it was supposed to be implemented. Tesla, Steinmetz, all those people, and all that. Everybody was horrified by what happened to their inventions. The more I experimented with this lost science, the more one name kept coming up over and over again. Eric Dollard was the only one to recreate Tesla's key experiments with a new type of electricity. While everyone else never took Tesla past Frankenstein movies and Halloween parties, Eric Dollard had re-engineered the Tesla coils and written papers and equations. They worked. Where was Eric Dollard? What was he up to? How far had he gone? The good news, Eric was still alive and publishing. The bad news, Eric had all his labs taken from him and was living out of his car in the Mojave Desert. Time for action. Eric would not meet the same fate as Tesla. Not on my watch. They're afraid of its potential. Potential? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 just in, it's inherent in electricity to free everything. Free everything. <laughs> <laughs> Do. They want to get rid of all radium. Why? Because it's too free. Too free. Yeah. You can't, uh, it's too hard to regulate, particularly high frequency radio. Anybody, you know, with a PRC 47 like in my car can, you know, talk to anybody in the world. But RCA wanted a new system, and that's what it would turn out to be. Long after RCA died, that's what it turned out to be. I didn't know that then, and they didn't know that then. I was just gonna, well, the most likely guy to figure out something new. They already knew from supporting my high school experiments and, and letting me use the station for my own purposes. They knew that I was the guy that was going to come up with something new out of all the old junk. Because I was already doing stuff in the laboratory that nobody could even explain. I didn't know, they didn't know, nobody knew what it was going to be. I didn't even know who Tesla was, nor did they. <laughs> and it was time to go to Wardenclyffe. That's what RCA wanted in the beginning anyway. But by then, by 1990, I had that all figured out. Good, Wardenclyffe all figured out in 1990. Yeah, I was ready to implement it. 
And that was the place to do it, and that's what the states, that's what KPH needed. Needed a new way to talk to ships at sea. Using Tesla technology. Using Tesla technology. Or Alexanderson, or both. Or improve. Or improve, yeah. That's what so I was going to start with the basic, uh, you know, the basic uh, Tesla transformer. I have built an experimental model. It was, I was all ready for the first test to the receiving station up to Point Reyes. They were laughing about, you know, the air is going to transmit to the, through the ground to the receiving station. <laughs> the, the station manager was anxiously waiting. You know, and I showed the test of the transformer, you know, and its ability, you know, to light fluorescent lamps, uh, you know, without any power loss. That kind of blew the transmitter tech away. You know, the thing, the amp meter showed it was definitely transmitting in the station ground. You know, I had a little RF milliamp meter, and it was putting, you know, there's current going in the station ground. So the thing was to do it outside the shielded room of the station and, and do it out on the Alexanderson antenna thing and then have the guys up at the receiving station see what level they picked it up. And then go, then go down to 500 kilocycles and do it to ships at sea. Did you get a chance to finish this? No, no. MCI uh, boarded the station and tried to wreck it. It was for ship to shore. Ship to shore. Ship to shore. Can't they communicate now? From the ship? Yeah, but this doesn't have the delay or the attenuation. So how it improve in performance? Yeah, and the receiver would run off the transmitter. Okay, going to that's, the that's the Tesla's idea. Is the receiver runs off the transmitter. It doesn't require any source of power. And the signal doesn't fade. And it doesn't weaken with distance. So it didn't require any It would work anywhere power. in the Pacific. And there'd be, though, but the way that place is geologically set up and, and the grounds that are already there and the Tesla system, I expect the signal would be just, just as strong in China as it was off the coast of San Francisco. So, and there probably would be no time delay, or the time delay would be much less than the propagation of light. So it would significantly improve this. So because that's the ground terminal into the earth. It was selected for that by Marconi. That's the Indians call it the hole in the sky. They went there and electrified them, and then they ran away from it. They wouldn't live there. It was sacred to them. Yeah, it's it's a it's a uh, it's kind of like a ley line runs through there. And the whole geology around there concentrates on this spot. It's like all the trees are lined up with it, and everything focuses on where that building sits. Wow. So according to the Marconi guys, there was five energy spots on the planet that were originally selected to try to build a global system, and Bolinas was one of the most important ones. Talk to ships at sea doesn't sound too exciting, and can't we already do that? What does this have to do with Wardenclyffe? Wardenclyffe was a project to transmit electricity and radio with minimal losses over vast distances through the earth and the ocean. What the ever-modest and cautious Eric Dollard is doing by talking about ships at sea is offering his version of Wardenclyffe as a service to the U.S. Navy while not incurring the wrath of the oil companies. There's a reason Eric Dollard has stayed alive this long. Eric Dollard's version of Wardenclyffe is even more advanced than Nikola Tesla's as it will allow the sending of radio and electricity at faster than light speeds through the earth to any point on the earth or sea with absolutely no losses. By placing it on a powerful ley line like at Bolinas KPH, it will even synthesize and magnify the energy on the way, exceeding even what Tesla had imagined. Not bad for an old guy living in the desert. came up with something new that nobody, not Alex Anderson or Tesla, had ever come up with. I raised it to the next level. I was able to make it broadband. It was, it was a, a general laboratory and, and facility in, in antenna-type communications of all different forms, all different frequencies, from microwaves all the way down to, to audio. The whole idea was, was, was to have 
the broadest, most generalized receiving capability possible. In other words, the ultimate receiver. Two days before they happen. What percentage it, it, it worked twice for two earthquakes. Which one? Northridge and Landers. I got the same thing from Japan two days before the giant Japan earthquake. Fukushima. Yeah, I picked it all the way up in Landers. One hour before the first earthquake, and uh, two, that was about two days before the main event. Oh, it would just go wild. How did it sound? Well, different signals, different places seem different sounds. Here it was the sound of screaming, screaming sounds. First, it starts with ricocheting bullets, and then uh, they get snappier or more like steel wires being hit, and then uh, they get stronger until eventually it's like whole dumpster loads of beer bottles being dumped on uh, metal decks of ships or something, smashing. And it, it just builds up a sharper and sharper pitch until eventually the thing basically just freaks. It's like almost like a sine wave. That's about uh, 12 hours before the blast. The blast. Yeah, 6.5 or greater earthquake. At the Alexanderson received <clears throat> from the interior of the earth. And then there was a, what's called a beverage. That's another RCA inventor, beverage. <coughs> was an overground antenna that received from the ionosphere. And then the whole system was stereo. So on the, uh, the, the audition system, the right-hand channel was underground and the left-hand channel was overground. So you could pick up stereo in two different dimensions. It all depends what's going on. Lightning storms or, you know, earthquakes, tornadoes, solar flares. The musical sounds come from inside the earth. Otherwise, you have to drill that hole. You have to drill a hundred foot deep hole, and then you have to make an electrolytic uh, uh, electrode to go down that hole and make contact with the soil around it. And you can never do it as good as a plant can, because that's the whole plant's way of life. It's grounding. <laughs> In fact, I have a whole description of the system on the internet. It's What's called it's called System for the Transmission and Reception of Telluric Electric Waves. It's about 20 pages. It gives a complete description of my whole telluric ionospheric transmission concept in the form of a, of a patent statement. So you willingly gave it to the public because you yeah, want well, this Yeah, well, good luck letting them figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Not one book. That's what that capitalist mentality does. It causes these people to hoard their stuff off in the corner, you know, and just spit at everybody and, and not tell anybody what's going on. Then it all gets lost. You know, Steinmetz was the other way around. They would force him not to write things in his book. Well, Steinmetz is the hero. <laughs> Describe him. He's the guy. He's a he's a deformed, a hunchback dwarf. <laughs> like Igor from Igor from Frankenstein. Yeah. So was Igor actually based on? Yeah, him? that was Steinmetz. And who was Doctor Frankenstein? Tesla. <laughs> Just to convince people of the horrors of electricity, it was kind of holdover from you know the Edison uh, electrocuting circus animal days. Uh, what was the Frankenstein monster? Who was he? No, that's, that's present-day technology. <laughs> he took all the crap out of the mathematics. He, he de-euroed it. And they didn't like him for that. So any engineer could understand. Yeah, that was the whole idea.
And it was like... And that's how Alexanderson came about. Alexanderson immigrated all the way from Sweden just to work with Steinmetz when he was 18 years old. He's another excellent He's the guy that invented that, all that stuff at RCA, the, you know, the, the radio frequency stuff, the Alexanderson antenna. There's no mathematical analysis available for any of this stuff. There's no way to express it analytically. But, but I are. came up with a way to do it. Now, the Steinmetz's method. What do you call your method? It's called the Verser method. Ver yeah. What was Steinmetz's and, and, and everything has to be expressed in, in four terms rather than two. Ah. That's the problem. Because you can't solve an algebraic expression higher than the second degree. And mine were all fourth and eighth. This stuff takes a long time to put together. <laughs> Forty-five years. All by myself, with while all working? yeah, with all broken equipment pulled out of junkyards. While working on another job. Well, and I had to pay for it. <laughs> on top of that. And you did it. Yeah. And then somebody fucked it all up <laughs> when it was done. We're going to fix that, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh and then goodness. the bully got to get shocked. The teacher would force it to happen and make a mockery out of him in front of the entire class. And then the rest of the year, he wasn't a bully. And how many he was volts? a guy that would get bit. How many kilowatt hours? Well, you know, I, I made sure to keep it, you know, less than like five milliamps or, you know, a ten. Just, you know, about like getting slugged by a baseball bat. But it's not <laughs> nothing to really, you know, do any damage to your body. It scares you more than anything. <laughs> Can't, no, I don't know my right from left. I can't tie my shoelaces. So the yeah, so they have the captain's inspection. Of course, I fail. You know, so the, the captain curses me and the whole thing, and I'm thrown out of line and all that. Well, that's fine. So I go back to work in the building. The executive officer is a Marine Corps. He's a uh, lieutenant colonel, and they're nasty. So I try to go back in the building, and he st stands in front of me. And he looks at me and he says, Dollard, you are a slob. <laughs> and then he goes, but you do such damn good work, get back inside. <laughs> Possible. I don't like being without it. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen, God willing. The people get behind you if they know what you're trying to do and yeah. why it's important. Why should they be interested in it? Maybe they have dreams too, just like you. You know, we have dream empathy. When people we like and admire have dreams similar to ours, they could help ours, we want to help them. We can see. <laughs> Ever pessimistic Mr. Dollard, except when he has to build something, then he knows it's going to work. <laughs> but not much belief in his fellow humans. Can we prove him wrong? What? <laughs> Eric Dollard is the last link we have to a lost age of science, an age that began in ancient Egypt, flourished in Greece among Pythagoras, was exemplified in the cosmology of Kepler, the music of Bach, taken through its experimental pinnacle by Nikola Tesla, and made into reality by the math of Steinmetz. The entire technological world we now live in is a highly degraded form of what this technology was intended to be, a technology that is more ancient than you, and more natural than technology at all. Nikola Tesla ended his days impoverished and died alone in his hotel room, only to have the truth about his work suppressed, even today. The very same forces that banished Tesla are doing the same thing now to Eric Dollard. They have exiled him solitary confinement in the desert. They have destroyed all his laboratories, and with them, 45 years of his work. Yet, they have not broken his spirit, nor will they, for he is made of far sterner stuff. This time, it is going to be different. We are a dedicated group of scientists, engineers, and believers in the power of the human spirit. We need you to join us in our quest to bring this great gift to humanity, a gift that will change all the rules. Every great wizard needs warriors to protect him while working his magic. This means you. You have to run with the music. So it's not background music. No. And it takes about ten listenings before you finally get it. You have to work your way up into it. It's not something you just dive into. It started with the Italians of what's called polyphonic music. When they, they learned how to play uh, two or more notes simultaneously. When was that? And that started in about the 1500s. That, that's when the music basically, as we understand it, became invented. Yeah, the Italians were the ones that did most of this. With uh, An Italian priest named Antonio Vivaldi. Vivaldi? Yeah, was the, the one that really pushed all before. But all, all of the Italian musicians, particularly uh, uh, Frescobaldi and Gabrielli are, are, are two of them. That's, that developed the initial polyphonic music. And then Bach became the master of it. And then Handel was the great popularizer of it. So you Handel, Bach, Vivaldi, Gabrielli, 
about Luther. Uh, and uh, and what was the other one? Gabrielli and Frescobaldi. Um, Luther, Martin Luther. No. Martin Luther was the beginning. He wrote the initial pieces of music. For the organ of the church. Well, the initial. Uh, that was still the Pythagorean modal music. So all this comes from Pythagoras. Yeah, it all comes from Pythagoras. The modal music, you call it. Modal. Yeah, it's uh, the only pieces of it remain. It's called major and minor. Major and minor. Yeah, well, those are all part of what are called church modes. Church modes. Yeah, those are extensions from the original Pythagorean system, and they had the distortion factors. Bach finally distorted the whole thing and erased it, and made it a, a pure logarithm. So music from every at that point on, always sounded harsh. But that's the only way he could play in all keys. Otherwise, you had to retune the organ for every key you played. See, the voice didn't matter with the voice because you could move the frequency everywhere. There was a stringed instrument, but the organ is the first digital device. It's an analog computer, but it's a digital keyboard. So now you're stuck to discrete frequencies. So every key, you have to retune the organ. So, so, so digital yeah, well, actually, the clavichord. clavichord, clavichord, which turned into the harpsichord and the pipe organ. The pipe organ is one of the oldest. And with all the stops and the pipes, it's an analog computer of an incredible complexity. It's a waveform synthesizer. And they, the organ is a waveform Yeah, they can't make them anymore. And the old ones are all the metal fatigue and everything. They're all rotten. It's all gone now. They can't make them anymore? They don't know how to make any of that stuff. Are you serious? It's too complicated. They couldn't do it. None of, none of that can be duplicated. That was made by masters. They just did it all in their head. The guy that made, the, made organs with 15, 20,000 pipes, you know how he measured the spectrum? He went into the church and, and took a stick and threw it on the ground and listened to the echoes, let that cook in his head, and build a 15,000 pipe, pipe organ out of it that resonated with the church. And there was no insurance back then. If you fucked up, your head got fed to the fish. <laughs> but no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> it just simply worked. It wasn't a quite question whether it was going to work. Because if it didn't, you died. So these masters that made the organ, that was it. Silberman made, made most of the great organs in Germany. So, Silberman. Silberman. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know who made it. France had their own brand. Fra France made some incredible sounding organs, but they sounded different than the German organs. And so, then the English, you know, had, had their organs and all that. And, and all of them are, are resonant. They're analog computers. You build waveforms by adding harmonics. You can make any kind of waveform you want. And, and the physical feeling of being in the churches when these things are running in full power is beyond description. Really? Particularly when all the planets are lined up. Wow. Scares the organists. The whole the church sounds like it's going to come apart. The organists start to lose control. The whole thing gets wrapped up into the cosmic event. The and, just goes, party. and just goes wild. And it uh, leaves the audience in, in complete shock. Thousands of people just like stunned in shock. They, they had a grand organ concert at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco right during the planetary alignment. That church was smart. They played that whole solar cycle. And it did a series of 12 organ concerts. Half of the music was Bach. And, and, and it got nearer and nearer the planetary alignment. The performances started becoming more and more stunning. And larger and larger quantities of people started showing up. So finally, the last one, there's only one seat to sit in in the whole church where all the phases line up. We'd always get those seats beforehand, hours beforehand, and make sure they were reserved. Your family? No, me and David. Here. Yeah, in San Francisco, David Franklin. So they had an we could we we were doing that whole Sonoma State study, and the organ concert series was in that exact sync with the solar flares. And you had, the, of course, you were there at every one of those concerts, and they just lit that church up. We spent days preparing for these events, hiking around in the woods, and, and just like living on fruits and vegetables, you had to take at least a ten-mile hike before the organ concert, what? and then get there at the top of that mountain. And, uh, and then there's a couple other things you do, and you have your seats are all arranged right where all four organs, pipe organs, cross. In the cross of the church itself, they're all built like giant crosses, and they have four organs in them. They have the forward and reflected organs, the giant ones in front and back, and then they got the side organs, and there's two seats on either side of the aisle in the middle, and you get those seats 
all the waves add up in that spot and it produces, you go out of your body. You just go out, during the concert, you just go out of your body. You're not even in, in normal world anymore. The whole thing just completely overwhelms you. And you can actually see the music and the whole, but just in that one spot. So the, so the grand concert, the church was too crowded. So they had to put everybody out in the main thing. But the, uh, the organ concert built up so much power uh, that the whole church, went, right after the concert ended, the whole church went silent. There wasn't any applause. And the organists were like frozen, staring, like with weird looks on their face at their keyboards. It's just the whole place just like went dead. It was quiet. No one was clapping or anything. And then all of a sudden, all thousand people jumped up for a simultaneous standing ovation like the, the church had never seen. It just it just blew everybody away. How long was that standing ovation? It was, uh, it was, the concert went on for about two hours. Wow. It built with, you know, like one of Bach's most famous uh, organ works, the, the horror movie one. God in D minor. Yeah, he, oh. wrote, he wrote that when he was 18 years old. But I don't like that. It's juvenile and it's too dark and whatever. But these guys and the church and the alignment and the whole thing uh, gave it a rendition of that piece of music that just, just wiped everybody out, including them. They lost control of the whole resonance. The building literally felt like it was going to fly apart. There was no concept of space or time anymore. You got wrapped up into this Bach cosmic cycle, and it just kept working you phase after phase, and it got deeper and faster, and the voltage higher and higher, and it just wiped everybody out, wiped the whole audience and the organists out. And it was stunning, because when you walked in, all the planets and the moon and the sun and everything were all lined up, and this thing started at sunset. It's 1980. 1980, October 13th, 1980. 1980. Yeah. And it was on top of a hill. In San Francisco, Grace Cathedral is a duplicated uh, cathedral. It's a 7,200 pipe organ driven by like a 25 horsepower blower. Wow. So those organs, you can put each one in a place. You add all the harmonics in space and time, and you can make pressure, you can make entities in that church. The church is built like an Alexanderson antenna. Four columns. The columns are all loaded. And you have standing wave organs pointed at each other. So you can maneuver these harmonics around in the space and position them. And they have like littler harmonics. They're like ball bearings, like those pictures of atoms. And you build these things in the space. And if you're sitting in one of those zones, you know, if you put an altimeter in there, like my altimeter, the thing will go wild. The pointer will just start dancing around. There's intense, like, low-pressure and high-pressure centers, and they coalesce like a giant molecular structure in the church. Wow. And the master organist and the organ, the organ builder knows how to, to, to control all those things, so the organ is part of the church, and the whole thing turns into a giant analog waveform generator. And then the music of Bach is designed to magnify that on top of it. The, creates a backwards time cycle. The music actually starts and ends at both ends. That's the problem with it. No one knows how he did it. Bach. Yeah, there is no end or beginning. The end is the beginning. The beginning is like Steinmetz's equations. They go backwards and forwards in time and make things happen in between. So Bach, Bach could use these alternating current cycles uh, to work this stuff and, and just build these energies. So Bach was AC. Well, it's time. It's all time-based. He knew how to make music go backwards in time and forwards in time and fit together. He wrote a 20-piece organ piece just before he died. That's the one that I, I studied at Boletus because I had the, the Marconi building as my own cathedral. This all happened during the alignment. And I had giant stereo, and I studied that music for hours and days. It took, uh, it took months of listening to it to finally get the picture uh, it was enough to knock you out of your chair, particularly in that building. Philo would come out there, and he would just stand there, frozen with tears in his eyes, and just completely frozen uh, by the sounds. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, it, it, in this space. And we used to bring him out there to heal him with it, because he was all screwed up on drugs and booze and, and psychosis and the whole thing. So we bring him out there. And, and fire the whole, you know, sound system up in the Marconi building, get them all high on vegetable juice and, and the whole thing. And it would just go through his body and just 
all of a sudden, you know, he would just freeze. It was like he would be rejuvenated. <laughs> it works. Yeah, I used to, Landers, I used to deliberately sit between the speakers. And friends of mine that had back problems, I convinced them to sit between the speakers and let the stuff pass through your body, and it regenerates your body. You have to sit in between the speakers, just like being in between all those organs in the church. Like a awesome. <coughs> well, it's a mechanical thing. It's kind of like ultrasonics. Mechanical, just the air pressure. Yeah, the vibration. So the vibrations of the air hitting. Well, the and your body. When the sound waves go through your body, they move your body. And you're in a standing wave zone in between speakers, just like you're standing in between the organs of the church. And there's these zones, and they move around. They make things fly off the bench. Anti-gravity? Well, it creates a vortex, and it throws things from the surface. The waves in the bench move around. They throw things into the surface. So you're sitting in there in that church, and you feel a current in the room? You feel space. this stuff moving through your body like you're invisible. Like the ether. It's actually moving. Solid stuff. You could actually, it, when your mind is trained and you're tuned into the whole thing, I would, you know, most people wouldn't even get this. Yeah, you're an extreme sensitive. Yeah, we, uh, we prepare days for this stuff. Days. Sometimes like weeks. To get ready to, to be at that level for the full voltage. Wow. Wow. And then and then they're at the spot, you know, and, and you just close your eyes and go into another universe. Really? Yeah. Wow, that sounds You're just like gone. And then you're so high from it afterwards you walk the full thirty miles back to Belitus and end up there the next morning. Because it's a planetary alignment, total planetary alignment or whatever, there's always a full moon. Stronger that experience, like physically, you feel just rejuvenated, healed, strengthened. What? <coughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just fun, you know. <laughs> I <laughs> no idea. Of course, you feel good. That's why you walk all 30 miles back to Belitus. All 30 miles. Yeah, over Mount Tam. Over Mount Tam. Yeah, over the ridge, 1,800 feet. You have to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. Usually, it's closed, then. you got to take the bus across the bridge. So you walk all the way to. All the way back to Belitus. Belinas, you can walk from Belinas to San Francisco. Yeah, I used to do it all the time. There's a bridge. Well, you have to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. At certain hours, you can't do that. They have to take the bus across. They take it on foot from there. So altogether, it's 30 miles. Yeah, it's about 30 miles. It's a brutal hike. The concert ends about nine o'clock, and then you get out there and you're hoofing about four or five miles an hour. Oh, wow. You got and you got Mount Tam ahead of you. You know, plus you got to get out to the bridge. You got to get over the first ridge in Mill Valley, 800 feet. Okay, you got you got to you got to march that. Then you go back. Then it takes you back down the Mirror Woods. You lose all your elevation. Then you got to fight yourself up from 200 feet up to 1,800 feet in the dark in the redwoods. Only if the moonlight. So the you know, you march beach. over that, and then it's all downhill to Stinson Beach. Uh, you get to Stinson Beach. You know, it's really steep down. You got to be careful not to land on your ass, fall into the sticks. You get down there, and then it's an eight-mile walk from there to downtown Bolinas on Highway 1. And by the time you get to Bolinas, the sun's coming up. Do you have a beer? And you're finally that? tired. What was the first drink you had? I don't know. I think he just went to sleep. I don't particularly remember much after once arriving in Bolinas, you know? Wow. That's about the only time I'd see David dragging his feet behind me. Usually he was in front of me. Your friend, David. Yeah. Brown. He's the only guy that could keep up with this stuff. He had the mind and the body for it. Wow. Yeah, you know, he was ready. He was an abandoned child. So and I, I picked a number of these uh, uh, the discarded youth up off the streets, and, and they turned out to be the real geniuses and people to hang out with. <laughs> what luck. Lucky, <laughs> lucky them. Yeah. Picked them up, saved them. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I pulled about three or four people out of the gutter. You know, and it ran there out in the bush with me for a decade or so. Wow. You know, eventually they go crazy or get into drugs or something bad happens to them or they get ripped off or, you know, all of a sudden I end up in a whole different state or whatever. You know, when I moved to L.A., that was the end of all that. Really? There's no, you know, living in the bush like that down there in L.A. you got to have a job. But the woods were freer there. See, I couldn't live in my car up north. It's all closed. You have to slither around there like a rat at night. 
But in Southern California, back then, there weren't any gates or fences. Then I could really live outside the way I wanted to. I didn't have to have a place to go to. That's how this came about. This, this was kind of a commute stop between uh, Fallon and Landers. And I, just, I just started staying longer and longer and longer and longer, and then eventually there was no reason to leave. There was nowhere to go to. <laughs> That's where it's at now. So I don't know, is this thing still recording me? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. That's enough. <laughs> Well, there's always somebody that's going to want to have, you know, a seismograph in their living room. So I could they can see what the latest earthquake looks like, why it's happening. <laughs> Anywhere in the world. Well, whatever the Internet does. Same thing, you could take your AM radio and you could plug it into the computer and you could use my antenna to listen to the AM radio stations around the world through the earth. So landers could detect. Signals well, the next the next the step was the the multiplex system to take the signals in and out of there. See, because this station has to operate in a phase uh, relation with another station somewhere else exactly like it. What are the potential applications of having the data? What could you do? It, with it's it? earthquake forecasting. And tornadoes, volcanoes. Well, they all make signals, but you know the, the earthquake thing is what that was after. Just the earthquake. Could you see kind of living maps of the earth? By kind of well, that's why I started needing, I need more stations for that. How detailed a picture could you get of the inner earth? And how well, I, the, these things are all speculative. You know, I only talk about things that I've built. Okay. But that's how the stereo works. The sounds move around. Tesla had figured out a way to do it. Uh, also inside the earth, both electrically and mechanically. What, if you make the right mathematical function at the antennas, you can have a spot anywhere in the earth and you can position it. It's no problem at all. It's, that's totally mathematically and physically conceivable. But it's not built. Yet. No. <laughs> Eric Dollar right. has not accepted that job yet. Well, it all got torn. It's all torn apart now, and then the parts are scattered. So that's the end of that. The applications for this are amazing. You could sense ores in the earth, perhaps, with additional. Models. Yeah, but I'm, I'm right. I can say I'm only talking about uh, what's what's been built. The, yeah. the first thing to do is to listen to the signals and study them before you even start saying anything about them. And, and the obvious interest is the earthquake aspect, and that's the most bizarre. Why do these signals even come about? The predictive signals. Yeah. And there's a whole variety of signals that come out of the earth, all right, kinds of so different so. sounds. There's like nine or ten different sounds, and they all work together. It's almost like when you close your eyes and listen to your signals, it's like you're in these rocks, and they're all each rock makes its own sound. Did you hear about that episode a couple of months back where the earth was howling and the sky was howling, this natural howling that happened all over the world? No. Okay. Well, I know that happens. Oh, there, there was about six, seven years that you couldn't go anywhere out here in the desert without hearing this induction motor noise. Really? Yeah, everywhere. From a power plant? I don't know. You just heard it everywhere. Sound like a big giant induction motor, like your refrigerator. How does that sound like? It's got this pulsating sound. Like what? Well, you have to hear it. It's a, it, Well, just listen to your refrigerator run. I see. And listen to the that? hum. It constantly changes. It, it pulsates. You could hear it everywhere. It just was everywhere. On the phone or? No, no, where you were, when you were outside. You couldn't get it like these damn jets. You could never get away from the sound. You could actually hear it. Yeah. Faintly. Yeah, there's places like that, the desert, and that do that all the time. Noises. And then the quartz crystals in the ground do the same thing that the lander station did. They, they're like transducers. So they make the electricity and the sound that you can hear. So if you get in a big pile of uh, crystal uh, uh, quartz-type rock outcropping, 
and you sit there and there's a big uh, electrical event going on inside the earth, the rocks will act like speakers and you'll hear the sounds. It's got to be quiet, real quiet. But you can hear them. Wow. Certain rocks you can hear. They make, they make, they, re they change their shape uh, to, uh, decide, depending upon the electric field they're in. You put an electrostatic field on a rock, it changes its shape. If you change its shape, it produces an electrostatic field. So with landers working, anyone on the internet could have accessed live seismic data from all over the world? Well, from that station. From that station. And how it picked up all around the world. What was its range? The station, What's that? The range of landers. Well, the range depended on how you used it. Earth. There was no definite range. So global. Less the global. seismograph is global. It dealt with the Earth as one object. There was, there was no distinction between separate earthquakes with this seismograph system. It was one planet. Everything that happened on the planet, the, the, the graph and, and the, the scope never stopped moving. It was like waves on the ocean. Never stopped moving. There was always jolts and, and surges and, and standing waves and, and you know, and the, the, the uh, impulses made by coyotes running around out in the desert, you know, the big rigs driving on the, the highway about, you know, five, ten miles away. You'd have a little bit of that in the background. You could hear it all. Yeah, you could actually put on headphones and hear it. You could hear a coyote in the desert walking. Yeah, angry. and well, you can tell, like, you know, the coyote walk one way, people walk a different way. Uh, you, you know, this. the rats jumping around and all that type of stuff. And you get any wind at all, it makes it really difficult to get any signal because this, this thing was ultra high sensitivity. And it was attached to these type of rocks that go 30 miles into the ground. It's attached to a rock formation that went 30 miles, one big chunk of rock into the earth. Wow. That's, I, why, that's one of the reasons for using this geology because th this is just the gravel on the surface. That's all this is, is sand and gravel. It's just, uh, we're too tiny to see it as sand and gravel, but that's all it is, massive heaps of it. But the main chunks, there's whole plates of them that stick out of the ground here. They're like slabs, They're only 10 feet wide, but they go like 50, 60 feet in the air. The main pieces go all the way down to the other side of the crust of the earth. Wow. This, that... this is one of the the most embedded rock formations that you could ever attach your seismograph and your antenna to. So we're, right now we're sitting right in the middle of it. So, this is like the spot. Landers was the same geology. It's the exact same geology. These gigantic uh, plutonic boulders, you know, the extremely old granites that, you know, had been there for longer than any history anyone can even imagine. So these just big solid masses of, of rocks that have been here for e like eternity. These rocks act as antennas into the earth. Well, if, if you have a rock that big stuck in the earth, well, that sure makes it a lot easier to hear what's going on, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Not a, not a pile of sand. So these are natural earth antennas. Yeah, rocks. mechanically and electrically, because then then the diale the dielectric is uniform. It's one continuous dielectric medium in which to propagate waves through. And you attached your system directly to these natural antennas? Yeah. You use the roots of the plants as the underground antennas. The natural living roots yeah, of the antennas. Yeah, because they go down so deep, and it's the only thing you can drive your ground rod into because the rock is too solid to drive your ground rod, so you let the, the plant did the start for you. So you drive the ground rod into the center of uh, the best one that uses a creosote bush. Unfortunately, they don't have those around here, so you'd be stuck. You'd have to use something else. A creosote bush is the best. The and then the ground rod, you know, follows the path of the root if you're lucky. If you, if you're lucky if you can get an eight-foot ground rod in the ground and in, in that kind of environment. The plant can, continues to live, right? Yeah, those things, is, you know, they're indestructible. And the root goes down between like 90 and, and 300 feet. It's better if the plant lives. It has to. If the, plant, if the plant dies, the antenna is no good anymore. The plant has to remain alive. So your earth radio is cooperative with nature, not... Well, you have to. The plant is the only thing that you have that you can use that acts like a wire. 
Otherwise, you have to drill that hole. You have to drill a 100-foot deep hole, and then you have to make an electrolytic uh, uh, electrode to go down that hole and make contact with the soil around it. And you can never do it as good as a plant can, because that's the whole plant's way of life. It's grounding. <laughs> it has the perfect electrode surface. Everything's right. Then you measure it against station ground, and sure enough, in a place where a regular ground rod will give you a, a, a resistance of 10,000 ohms when you use the plant, the resistance is only 100 ohms. And that's acceptable because you usually design your Alexanderson antenna to be 300 ohms. So that's fine. You're, if your antenna impedance is greater than the ground impedance and about that ratio, that's exactly what you want. It just couples perfectly. That's the secret of antenna? Connected. It's no secret. It's just that's how it works. Transmission line. The transmission line impedance and, and the impedances that feed it and draw from it have to have certain proportions or the system doesn't work. Impedance is like resistance. Yeah, more generalized resistance. Resistance is part of impedance. And how, are there different kinds of resistance? Yeah, there's like negative resistance and positive resistance and there's resistance of like resistors and there's a resistance of radiation and there's electrolytic resistances and they, they, they can't all be equated. How about magnetic and uh, dielectric? Magnetic. Well, then it just goes even further. You know, you could go on forever. What do you mean? Well, you only can go so far with this uh, before no one's going to understand anything. It requires 10 hour long explanations. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm not going to get into the whole. I wrote about all that. Go read it. Which paper? All of it. <laughs> the whole thing that I wrote while I was here, just read the whole thing. That's the, that's the book on electricity. That's all I can say. The, the solar, there's 22 year long solar cycles. Of, of deadness and activity and deadness and activity. They, st they started in the early Renaissance. And they peaked out around World War II. And now that we're in cycle 24, the sun's going dead. And it's not creating an ionosphere. It's like the solar cycles are ending. So today the solar flux is 140 something. Put that bottle out of sight. It should be. Um, 200 and something. So the sun's only operating at half power right now for this part of the cycle. So you don't have the ionosphere that you need in order to communicate to other parts of the world. It's all dissipated. So ham radio is dying. Is well, I made it so there was no ham radio available for a year during the minimum of the cycle. Now we're at the maximum, and the maximum is no better than a minimum. So now the question is, is when it goes into the minimum in the next seven years, how dead is the sun going to get? The last minimum, it got record dead. The solar flux never dropped below 60, ever. This time it went down to 58. And you couldn't communicate via the ionosphere. So the sun can be reconfiguring for a, a cold, dead cycle, like in the Dark Ages. There's a popular book written on the subject called Jupiter Effect. It's actually fairly accurate. The Jupiter Effect. Yeah, it was about the total planetary alignment in 1980. And the solar flares that it was predicted to create, according to the RCA theory. And the solar flares happened, just like they were predicted. Enough finally trip off Mount St. Helens. Solar flux went up to over 400. The Earth actually wobbled on its orbit from the coronal mass ejections hitting it. When was this? 1980. October 1980. Is that where you did the ceremony? Where it controls all the frequencies. So if you don't know what the sun's doing, you don't know what frequencies to use. That's why RCA started radio astrology. You have to know what the sun's doing, and the planets tell you what the sun's doing. So RCA gave me the equipment, Sonoma State provided me with the place to do it, and the cosmos provided me with the total planetary alignment. So I was the guy with the equipment and everything right there as the thing happened. I studied the whole event over the couple of years that the whole solar cycle built into this alignment. There's no inside structure. 
Is it hollow? Yeah, there's only a surface. There's nothing inside. Is the sun actually, do we have combusting in on itself? Not burning anything. There's no fusion in the sun. That's well understood. Proven. Yeah, well, there's just not the way to prove that there is any. It's only in the flares do you get fusion. That's why all the x-rays, the flares, the arcs, and the x-rays, and the microwaves, and whatever result of fusion in the arcs. Is there's no fusion in the sun. They don't know how the sun works. Why do you, what's special, how does the sun make light? It's a transformer. It transforms from some other dimension. It's not burning anything. It doesn't have to. It's a converter. Of what? I don't know. Nobody knows. But that's what it does. That's the only thing it can do because that's how everything works. It's transforming from another dimension. Yeah, you could say it's taking energy from another dimension, counter space. There, there's no energy, actually. You can't, most of it you can't even measure in outer space or see. You can't see. No, you can't see the sun in yeah. free space. So the sun is not visible in outer space. Not in free space. It's only invisible when gross matter becomes involved, like the Earth's atmosphere and envelope and the surface of the moon or whatever. That makes the light. Otherwise, there is no light. You can see the moon, you can see the Earth, but you can't see the sun or you can't see the stars. But you can see the planets and yeah, the satellite. Yeah, right. You can see material objects, but you cannot see the sources of light. There is no light until there's a material object. To reflect off. So that means there's no time delay. So the whole time delay thing is, is meaningless doesn't take light years. There are no light years, because there's no light. So that, does, that means that the light you see from the distant stars isn't four million years old. It could be only minutes old. It could be instantaneous. All the theories collapse when you can't see the stars in outer space. This is where you log the solar flares? Well, whatever's going on in the day, the solar flux, the atmospheric pressure, the cloud types, you know, any other uh, particular interesting information. But this, this is, these are the positions of the hurricanes. So this was E, whatever that one was. I don't bother with the names, I just, there's letters. These are the ones. These, this, these occurred off of uh, Baja. Baja. It was recently? Yeah, well, this was in July. So that stuff moves up here and starts the thunderstorms. Yeah. So, well, well, nuclear fission is a religion. It's, it's a law, you know? The world must believe. That's all there is. Sure, the sun is an atomic bomb burning in the sky. If you don't believe that, you're going to go to jail. Okay, now, you, your theory <laughs> on the sun, I want to get. It's hollow. It's, so every planetary object is hollow, right? All hollow. Well, the sun's definitely hollow, because I studied the sun for four years straight. This is a question. And it's obviously hollow. Okay. And the solar... Uh, the, the, the sunspots are holes that allow you to see inside. Really? Yeah. It's dark inside. The sun is well understood in, in, in radio physics and studying the atmosphere and sunspots and all that stuff that the sun does not operate by fusion. They do not know how the sun operates. The fusion only comes out of the arcs because of the current density. That's where the hydrogen fusion occurs, is in the actual arcs, arcs between the flares. The sun itself is not a fusion device. So, uh, the fusion is only in the effect of the It's flare. a converter, yeah. The sun is a converter from another dimensionality into this dimensionality, and obviously if you can't, if you can't see it in outer space, the conversion's not complete until it hits the Earth's atmosphere or other physical object, and then it finally converts to so electromagnetic light. When it hits the ozone layer, it does Well, something. the Earth's envelope. The Earth's envelope. Yeah, it's under, Earth's envelope is undefined. Undefined. Yeah. But you have to get in the Wilhelm Reich about that. Like we were talking about how you can't see the stars anymore. Yeah, yeah. So the sun, would you say, it makes its quote-unquote energy some, through some electrical etheric process? Yeah, because of its voltage, so its position. Would you call it some kind of etheric lamp? A lantern? Yeah, it's like kind? a giant Tesla lamp. <laughs> you know, in the burner, the sun is converted. No. It's not burning anything. It's, so it's an etheric electrical yeah, converter. converter. And it's, it, it's converting from primary force to secondary force. And it, it, the conversion is complete once it hits the, uh, at, the upper atmosphere. Of the yeah, then, then once the, the emission interacts with physical matter, then it, it reverts to its reduced form the waste product, which is heat and light and mechanical activity. 
but it doesn't start off like that, and its origin is undefined because it comes from what people like to say another dimension, Sunspot. counter space. Sunspots are holes in the holes in the hollow sun. There's a photosphere that generates the light, and it's it's contiguous. It's not contiguous. It's little things that move around. Contiguous. Yeah. It's, a, it's an arrangement of little glowing spots, and it's dark in between. It's a veil. And, and that's where the illumination of the sun originates, is in that veil. It doesn't come from the inside. There's no nuclear furnace in the middle. There's none of that shit, and that's understood. When I studied this stuff in Sonoma State, that's understood. But they have to continue this popular image that the sun is a nuclear bomb burning in the sky. Scarcity. <laughs> because that's everything's got to work on destruction. Exactly. Burning right. something. Yeah. Yeah. Like the caloric theory. That's another. Yeah. Whatever. It has to be the laws of thermodynamics. You have to pay. So it has to no be a meter. If you can't put a meter on it, it's not real. Do you have any respect for Newton at all? Just. Too much reliance on radio, and it's creating a hostile RF environment. Radio is being used where radio was not intended for everything. You know, television remotes and silly phones and iPods and all that stuff. It's just RF extravaganza. That's not what radio was for. That's what telephone cables are for. So you feel the average human is being exposed? Too much RF. Is that bad? Yeah, thousands of times uh, greater exposure than Bell Telephone ever used to allow in any of their microwave sites. Even the Navy. So the average iPhone user right you're, now. You're out when you're standing out on the street in silly phone wonderland. Okay, you might as well be on the deck of an aircraft carrier being swept by search radars. It's that bad. That bad. Right now. Right now. If you look out your window and, and you're looking at a silly phone tower, you're getting a thousand watts of RF right in the face, right through your front window, lighting up your whole living room. Just like there was a ship radar about, you know, one mile out, sweeping through your house. Except it's not pulsed, which actually makes it worse. The pulses are so short, they can't really do a lot of damage, but this is continuous wave. It's, it's this treacherous amount of RF power. I couldn't when I first... See, there was some guy that was getting sick from all this stuff. He was rich, and he was getting sick from this stuff in uh, with Redwood City, and, and he couldn't find anybody. He just paid PG&E half a million dollars to put the substation feeders underground because they were giving him this horrible rheumatism. And then when they did that, $450,000 afterwards, it made it worse. So he realized that this is, you know, that was a disaster. He spent, you know, a big part of his his fortune. PG told him, well, we'll just put the lines underground, and it made it worse. Well, now it was time to find somebody that really knew what was going on. Mr. Dollar. There's only one guy. <laughs> Where are we going to find this It guy? took him a while, but he found me. <laughs> okay, and he was there, and he, the first thing he did, uh, you know, when I, when I met him face to face, was he reached in his wallet, and he pulled out three $100 bills and handed them to me. And told me he's going to pay me $100 an hour to find out why all this stuff is making him sick. That's just after they bulldozed Camp David. And I was like, you know, insane and destitute and the whole thing and, uh, you know, trying to juggle what cars I had around on the street. And, and it, it was really tough. So a $100 per hour job and, and a, my nice place to live in the Redwoods, which wasn't closed then, was welcome. You know, four hours a day, and then the rest of the days I'm out hiking around in the redwoods. It's great. <laughs> you know, four hundred dollars in my pocket every day. And he bought life. all the equipment. A lot of equipment. So you know, helped me build the station at Landers, and I could keep all the equipment. Mm -hmm. And what I learned there was flabbergasting. I could write a whole book about it of all the RF interference, from improperly operating AM radio stations to the five or 10,000 watts coming out of these cellular telephone repeaters. I never expected the power was that high. Uh, all kinds of stray power line currents. There was enough I could light a small light bulb off a ground rod. He was like in some vortex of, of just electromagnetic hell. <laughs> 
See, at first I thought he was a hypochondriac, and I really didn't want to get involved with it. Because I could see a, his problem was his body was so out of balance, that that's what made him sensitive to all this stuff. So I did experiments to see if he was really sensitive. Uh, first, to 60 cycle, you know, magnetic fields. And I uh, see, so, you know, I put him in a, I built like a big uh, Navy degaussing coil thing, like for a minesweeper or something, on a telephone cable and sat him in a chair in it. And then I would take, you know, the 60 cycle currents and have various magnetic fields directed, or sometimes I'd have no magnetic field, it'd be turned off. And I, you know, ask, do you feel that? Do you feel that? Do you feel that? And you feel that? And the guy had a remarkable sensitivity to low frequency magnetic fields. And it was consistent with my own observations in my own body is, is it causes rheumatic pain in the bones and the joints. Because when there's a magnetic storm on the earth, I get pains in my shoulders. I know there's a magnetic storm because the pains are in my shoulders. It's caused by solar flux. Yes, because of rheumatism. You know, could buy that and too much coffee. So uh, if I had to drink the coffee, I couldn't feel the, soul, the magnetic storm. So, uh, so then he was complaining about the burning on his face. So, you know, I got the spectrum analyzers to see what, you know, the radiation density was between, you know, like 800 megacycles and 1,200 megacycles, the silly foam band. And, and the power level was just mind-boggling. So and that's what was burning his face. It was just, you know, radar level RF power, you know, as soon as you open the back door, you know, it's going right through the walls of his building. Right? He had the chicken wire, the whole inside of the building, and I had to come up with a special ground system. And, and, and then there was something else that was making him weak all the time. So I did a whole analysis of the AM broadcast panel with this guy named Bill Gabbard. And he runs all these horrible RF pollution radio and TV stations in San Francisco. So he bought one station on uh, AM station out there in Redwood City on 1050. And then wasn't doing any band limiting or, or any of this stuff. And the station was like jamming out, you know, the AM band, 20 kilocycles on both sides, all the way into Los Angeles from Redwood City. So I analyzed all this with the equipment, and, and they were operating like a spark gap transmitter with that lousy digital, you know, hump and slap music. No filters going into a digital modulator, and it was just putting out this spectrum of pulses, and it got into the telephone cables and power lines, and was just wave guided right through Redwood City. And it just lit his building up. It got into all the telephone cables and the conduits and the whole deal just lit his building up, and finally I told him, you know, the best thing you can do is either you can spend a million dollars building yourself a radio frequency bunker, or move. <laughs> <laughs> That's a... Then uh, the silly phone companies or whatever got into his employees, and they started vandalizing my car and, and screwing with my tools and all that, so I was going to have to beat somebody's brains out, uh, so that was the end of that. So he gave me $1,000 and let me take all my equipment down the landers, and uh, that was a six-month learning experience, RF pollution. Kind of right it on top of my radish seed experiments in high school. Now, let's go out to the hole. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. So from the, from the first time I opened Bewley's book on traveling waves on transmission systems when I was like, you know, in the Navy, uh, to the point where I had actually conquered all the equations and came up with an engineerable antenna structure out of it. Well, that's from 19, let's say 1972 to 1992. That's how long it took to figure it out. Ten years. At least, yeah. This is... And this is from a man who was recreating Tesla's work at the age of 15 in his car garage laboratory. Yeah, well, this project's a lot more complicated than that, but, but it's the same. There's no mathematical analysis available for any of this stuff. There's no way to express it analytically. But, but I have. came up with a way to do it out of Steinmetz's method. What do you call your method? 
is called the Verser method. Ver yeah. What was Steinmetz's and, and, and everything has to be expressed in, in four terms rather than two. Oh. That's the problem, because you can't solve an algebraic expression higher than second degree, and mine were all fourth and eighth. Your algebraic expressions are fourth and eighth degree. The problem, the Alexanderson problem or the Tesla transformer problem in the most general expression is an eighth order differential equation. So there's no algebraic solution. It's never been developed. Kind of for the third, not really for the fourth, and anything beyond that, forget it. That's where this uh, uh, polyphase mathematics I'm studying is the only way out. And that's a Verser system, too. You're incorporating this new polyphase mathematics. No, it's not new. System. It was uh, developed for electrical engineers by a Westinghouse uh, mathematician in, in the, the like 1918. Almost 100 years old. Yeah, and then that allowed, uh, it made it possible to, to have reasonable calculations without horrible uh, masses of, uh, of like you know nine-dimensional matrix equations and stuff. You can't do any real engineering work with that stuff. It's too complicated. So your Verser method... Not, not, not my Verser, their Verser mathematics. Yours would allow a normal engineer to engineer this. Well, here's the problem. Okay, the problem is, is all well, Verser systems are only three. made for the dimension of time. There's no yeah. algebra hey, for sir, space. I was just going to let him know that That's a concerned citizen called There's in and no said that the truck is That's now gone from the residence. That's why you can't analyze any of this stuff, because it's not a problem in time, it's a problem in space. So your Verser method... Method I came up the with the Verser method for space, so you don't have to fool around with all that quaternion and the rest of that stuff that doesn't work. None of that stuff would work, but that's what all the books are based on. Heaviside said throw the whole thing into garbage, and that's exactly what I did. <laughs> so the reason we don't have floating skateboards like in Back to the Future is because we're using this outdated 2D math instead of your four, fourth and eighth dimensional. No, it's more complicated than that. First of all, you have the order of magnitude, or the degree of the equation is what it's called. But there's no algebra for space at all in any degree. Any degree. Any degree. Algebra is the mathematics of time not space. That is the whole flaw in the mathematical analysis of, of all these space complex structures. So this is not really algebra then? It is algebra, but it's a new type of algebra. It almost sounds like it's a totally different animal, but it's... The, it, okay. You, ha you have to be able to make the dimensional transformation. Would this new method That's all. deserve its own name? Perhaps dollar... Space algebra. Dollar algebra. Uh, the paper uh, uh, written by Dr. Alexander, uh, Alexander McFarland that allowed all this, he was the one that figured it out. From Austin. The guy at the University of uh, Texas. Texas. Yeah. And uh, he's the one that figured it out, but, but he didn't make it engineering. I had to take it from there and turn it into something that seemed engineering. And then I got it to the point where it, exp it, it defined all the movements of transmission in any uh, transmission system, like transformer windings or Alexanderson antennas or, or filter networks. It, it opened a whole different way of looking at all that. You didn't have to use all this brutal partial differential equations. And, and when you're still left with the same order, you can't sol solve those things. There's no simple formula to solve it. So its primary benefit is it would allow an ordinary engineer to calculate spatial math. Well, it, it would allow a developmental engineer that was smart enough to take raw mathematics, okay, and then apply it to an actual volts and amp situation. There's not a lot of people like that around. So this math was much more grounded in that a normal person could figure it out. It could be applied Well, this, this, ma this math is operating on a theoretical level. This math? What I'm talking about, it operates on a theoretical level. It's still not possible to get an exact calculation on a coiled winding because you have no way of measuring the quantities involved. Of copper? No, of, uh, the space quantities, capacitance and inductance. There's no way to calculate or measure that.
There isn't. Because you can't get into it, because you're dealing with traveling waves. It moves. So you have to come up with a four quadrant induction, inductance and capacitance equation. That, that's how you work the math in. So that requires a lot of experimentation and fooling around. And, you know, I can't do that living in my car. But, but if I use lumped networks, like Alexanderson networks, then it's a snap because all the quantities are directly calculable. In fact, they're usually fixed valued uh, units like regular coils and condensers. Because the, the Alexanderson system is an analog system. Tesla's is not analog. It's direct. The Alexanderson system is an analog computer that models the Tesla, the Tesla system. And it turns out to be, it doesn't matter if you have a real version or you have an analog version, they both work. That's the miracle. They both do the same thing. Where one is a you know, distributed winding with complex uh, quantities, the other thing is, is a mathematical model of it made out of coils and capacity. That was Alex Anderson's great discovery. power comes from another space, not inside the sun, it's from somewhere else. It's channeling from other dimensions? Yeah, well, that's the way the physicists like you to talk. How do you like that? You don't use dimensions. So it's another, either another coordinate system or another space or another time, or, uh, but I don't like to call it different dimensions. Okay. That, that confuses the mind. Yeah. Okay. It's only one dimension of space. You can't say 3D space or 4D space. That doesn't make any sense. There's only one dimension of space. 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 And when you think about it like that, then you can have space and you can have counter space because they're both in the dimensions of space. 3D space and 2D space, and those things are just math. Those are coordinate systems. They're mathematical abstractions. You can add any number that you want. It's arbitrary. But they force the whole mind state to think like that. That way you only think in terms of graph paper. You don't think in terms of generalized coordinate systems. And then when you get into this three-phase math, like I've been working on in that book, you see then all of a sudden you have a whole different type of coordinate system. Nine dimensions, according to the physics world. You have nine dimensions in time, which is only one dimension in time, because they're all frequencies of 60 cycles a second but some turns forward and some turns backwards and some don't turn at all. So you have nine components all together. So algebraically, normally you can't do complicated. You have nine simultaneous equations. It's too complicated. You can't apply it to practical problems. You must like, you like to spend all day dealing with you know, matrix algebra, which nobody likes. So this guy uh, that came up with that book, in that paper, he figured out a way to, to do it all geometrically. So he didn't need nine dimensions. Reduced it to two. Yeah. So sacred geometry is a comeback Well, no, but, but there's one a five-phase system all applies to sacred geometry, but there is no existing five-phase system. Your book does not develop that mathematics, but it's, it gets you started on it. It gives you just enough that you can carry it to other coordinate systems. It takes a lot of figuring. Have you gotten further? Yeah, I've, I've, I've started. I'm almost about ready to write a paper on the book. Oh, Pacific. Japan, ah. Australia, everything went in and out of Bolinas and so Point Reyes. All it, American communications in 1969 were going through Bolinas to through communicate Bolinas. With, with the Pacific. Right. After a year, I could go into that station in the morning, mm -hmm. okay, unannounced. I could grab the key ring off the fucking hook. And I could go through the entire installation in any fucking substation or transmitter. Complete 100% you know, like, access. Just, just whatever I wanted to do. And whatever I fucking dragged back, uh, if it had the right numbers on it, I could pack it home. Wow. <laughs> you're bad. Oh, you're a bad boy. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I didn't walk in there as a dummy. Oh, how old were you when you went in? Oh, that was 1966, I think. How old were you? 15. <laughs> So you had free run of the premier. Not rate. then. No, I had to work for it, and uh, and and go through some punishment routines too when I got a little out of line, like disappear for a year once. 
Well, that's when I started when I was a freshman. And by the time I was a senior, I had an awesome laboratory. It was giant. Wow. You know, I could produce three or four thousands of watts of RF, no problem at all. So you could light up a whole neighborhood. Well, I could make all the lights, you know, dim the lights in the whole neighborhood, <laughs> sucking that much power, about 10,000 watts off the transformer. That's to get a hold of stuff for free. <laughs> Without having to pay that. for it. You developed that skill early in life. You have to. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't have anything to work with. No one's going to buy it for you. You have to go find it. You got to find it, you know, pushed over a cliff or get the lineman to give it to you for free or whatever. Otherwise, you don't have anything to work with. It was a, a rapid developmental phase. So in high I had school, standard surplus in San Francisco for my Navy Glom. I had uh, Abe and Louie. They were the Glom Meisters. They had their fingers and everything. They had catacombs underneath the sidewalks into the street oh, filled with like missile parts and all this stuff. And they just let me go down to that bed, just let me run loose with a shopping bag. <laughs> they thought it was funny. You know? I was good and they couldn't figure out what in the hell I was doing with all this stuff, but they knew I was doing something with it. And I was a kid, so, you know, I could, I'd buy something and just let me take the rest for free. And no one else was allowed in the catacombs. <laughs> Only you. Yeah. Only Eric. He was like a crazy guy down there that, that had his own Glom collection. <laughs> the problem is, was getting his stuff past the counter because it became confusing of whose stuff's what. He wasn't supposed to be giving his Glom away, and he was give me all these expensive big Navy radio transmitting tubes and vacuum variable capacitors. And I was, you know, I, I, I built a whole Navy transmitter in a matter of just months out of this stuff from there. It was beautiful. I even, I even used part of it at Landers. It lasted that long. And then RCA started providing the big oil transformers and giant tubes and, you know, and, and the, the the stuff from the power company, all the big capacitors, it turned into a giant Frankenstein laboratory. What was your biggest challenge? Well, trying to control all this RF and developing the power supplies and the tubes and the, the resonant coils, and that's where I independently discovered the whole Tesla thing. So at the age of 15, you independently discovered the... Yeah, that the resonant coil and the monopolar transmission and the whole deal. It occurred right there on my bench, out of old RCA parts. But I didn't know about Tesla. I had no idea about Tesla. It didn't matter. I just, this stuff just worked. It was like at the, beyond the edge of what RCA understood. So they were always perplexed by the things that would get to happen with their equipment. But then they, they learned from that, that's why they were having problems earlier, that they never could figure out why. I, I ended up finding out why. Why this ball lightning would get out of control in the transmission lines and start breaking insulators and fireballs leaping around everywhere, and the technician just dives for the deck. When, when the captain decides, you know, here this guy shows up and now he's altering everything that's going on in this base, okay, force. And, and wrapping a noose around the Air Force and just leading them by a ring through their nose through balls of fire, you know, they're digging it, okay? <laughs> so you were the Navy's hero. <laughs> digging it. No, I don't know my right from left. I can't tie my shoelaces. So you're yeah, so they have the captain's inspection. Of course, I fail. You know, so the, the captain curses me and the whole thing, and I'm thrown out of line and all that. And he looks at me and he says, Dollard, you are a slob. <laughs> and then he goes, But you do such damn good work, get back inside. <laughs>
communications. This was the entire defense communication system for the Pacific, South China Sea, the whole thing. I operated, I worked right at the central link. Just for fun, with nothing to do on a mid-watch. You could go through the boards and find telephone calls that were absolutely flabbergasting. To believe that you had any privacy and long-distance telephone communication, you couldn't believe how many people were laughing at your telephone call behind your back. These things would just erupt at 1 or 2 in the morning from some board technician going through all the channel jacks and channel jacks and channel jacks until he hears that telephone call that's just out of this world. You know, usually some drunk sailor talking to his girlfriend. That's what most of them were after. Okay, and out it pops on the monitor speaker. Okay, so you've got a telephone that when you lift it, every DCS station has a speaker that hears what you say. It's called the order wire. So you pick up the order wire and you tell the guy, tell the guy at the Clark Air Force Base, you, you tell him what channel you've got it on. And if it goes through his system, he picks not. Otherwise, you send it to him on a trunk. So you patch over to a dead telephone line trunk, and he's listening to the call. And then you hear the order wire pick up again. Okay, and then he talks to his buddy over in some island somewhere. And he goes, we got this telephone call. Okay, and then he sticks it on a trunk. Now you got three microwave stations or satellite cable stations listening to this guy's telephone call. I've seen these things work their way all the way to the master control board of Voice of America, and all the guy has to do is flip a switch in every million watt transmitter in the world and be rebroadcasting this guy's telephone call. <laughs> that's, that's real phone preaching at a high level. Well, this is where all the phone lines came together. Wow. You know, I could make the phones ring in people's house uh, totally synthetically from my patch panel. I did it to my parents. The phone would ring, and I'd be connected to this massive trunk line, you know, and I could weave a path to any telephone in the world. You're the real lawnmower man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're 18? Yeah, it was great fun to have $2 billion of equipment to play with. And the Navy <laughs> loved it. Every minute of it. They did. Oh, yeah. Oh, they treated me good. They had to. You know, I mean, what more could they ask for? It's all I wanted to do was work on stuff. Why do you, I didn't join the Navy to sit around or get drunk. It was always enough for me to build my own radio station. You know, I pull my own little Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> Take the, take the station away from the Air Force, which the Navy thought was great. That was the beauty, is the Air Force, the, the laugh of the whole thing that everybody loved. I mean, they warned me, you know, Dollar, don't get yourself in trouble, you know, by engineering too many of your own circuits in the defense communication system. You know, I had like phantom circuits running down telephone cables around the base that would like reappear in the radio station and then disappear. You couldn't measure the existence of them and then they would reappear in another building to turn off the Air Force's equipment by itself. And they didn't know how the signal was sneaking into the transmitter. So you were sabotaging the Air Force for the Navy. <laughs> so I, 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 I looped their own signal. They heard the echo of their own signal and they, they thought that we, we were transmitting and it was just a patch cord in a jack on top of a mountain. <laughs> Took him a year to figure it out. <laughs> you were messing. You loved it. <laughs> well, the commanding officer loved it. That's what was important. The whole base loved it. It wasn't just that everybody was behind it. You know, they couldn't. It was just too much fun. <laughs> And then the glom. You know, the Navy wasn't allowed its own glom. It couldn't go into its own junkyard. And all the bases, all their test sets were aged and no good, and nobody could find any test sets. So I connived the way to the glom. Because I took over the Air Force Station. I had access to all its paperwork. So I filed the whole operation Air Force, showed it to the chiefs. They approved it. Okay, the this, this, this Subic uh, Supply Center would see it as an Air Force request. 
You would never think the Navy was behind it, except it was all Navy trucks and people that showed up to gather the Guam. I packed about three quarters of a million dollars stuff out in the first log and find a brand new crate of all the meters that the Navy was not giving to its own station and its own junkyard and resupplied every communication station with a brand new test set from the junkyard. The chiefs were just emphatic over the whole thing. They thought it was the most brilliant accomplishment that the Navy had ever achieved. <laughs> the greatest glob mission of all time. They rip off the Air Force on top of it. <laughs>
a uh, giant hurricane hit the Philippines and it knocked out the whole microwave system because the water is so dense, the microwaves and satellite beams can't even go through it. Well, lo and behold, turns out the emergency transmitter doesn't work. And on top of that, nobody knows Morse code. And, and they have to get the emergency net going because the bases are all isolated. So at any rate, there's no time for me to be fooling around with any Navy procedure or any of that. So I go back into my childhood mode of hunting for the problem in the transmitter. It was an emergency. I had to get that transmitter working. I had my old little voodoo sticks with neon bulbs and things that these chiefs had never seen before. You know, so I invented this stuff all when I was a child because I didn't have any fancy test equipment. And they wanted to stop it. And the commanding officer uh, put a, an end to that right then and there. They go, we got to get this transmitter going. And this is the only guy that can do it and the only guy that knows Morse code. So stand aside and let Dollar do what he's supposed to do. So that was a real slap to Chief Kelly right there. He wanted to start putting all this unsafe working practices. There wasn't any time for that. Like, were there lives on the line? The well, whatever, is we were isolated from the world, had no communications. The whole the base? Or? Yeah, the whole, all the bases, all became isolated all in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Yeah, the only way to communicate was via shortwave radio. The whole system went dead. You pick up your telephones, nothing worked. So for the, for the entire Pacific? The entire Philippine Islands okay. during this hurricane. You had San Miguel, you had Subic, you had Clark Air Force Base, you had Mount St. Arena, you had uh, Sangley, uh, QB Point. Everybody all of a sudden was all cut off. The whole, you couldn't go outside because of the 120 mile an hour winds. You're top of a 12 story microwave site on top of a mountain. You really like to have an emergency radio when this whole thing's swinging around and lightning is striking the building and sparks are shooting out the deck plate and the chairs are moving around on the floor because the building's being twisted around by the hurricane. It's a scary situation. And in the middle of this, you have to get this transmitter working. have to get this transmitter working. What happened? Well, I got it working, <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> that was understood that Dollar would get it working. Dollar can make anything work. Anything at all. He doesn't need any test equipment or any help. <laughs> he does it by these strange things with light bulbs and sticks and pencils and things that, that scare people. Because you have to do it while the equipment's on. <laughs> like holding little light bulbs in my hand and my fingers and making them light up. And the other guy, ah! I've never seen anything like that before. about why the system was so noisy. And it was obvious after realigning the entire system and finding that there was no problem at all that the system wasn't noisy at all. The Air Force gave him bad test procedures and it made him think that the whole system was screwed up and they were spending years analyzing and studying it. There wasn't anything wrong in the beginning. It was the Air Force's fault. So they sabotaged the Navy by giving them bad data? Yeah, the Air Force is all screwed up and refused to use Sapel system standards, and then uh, then they get on their high horse and they're telling everybody else what to do. So the, they gave the, the Navy the wrong test specifications. So all you had to do was just switch the test switch one position on the meter, and then all of a sudden there's nothing wrong with the whole system. They spent two or three years trying to figure out what was wrong, and there wasn't anything wrong at all. It was the Air Force did it. So you uncovered a conspiracy and saved the Navy billions. Yeah, well, I got the Air Force out of the deal. <laughs> it took me to get the Air Force to take the AFRs to S station away from them, you know, and, and to eliminate their fingers in, in the defense communication system whole test program, just get them out of it all the way. I mean, you know, the, the dirt was on their hands. You know, the situation was laughable. You know, here, you know, they, uh, I was the top guy in, in, in broadband carrier communications from Bell Telephone in high school. And, you know, they thought they were going to throw the big one at me, you know, because I was arrogant and had all those weird test scores from school. So, and, you know, the Chiefs want to tease a situation or whatever. You know, that's just the way they are. They're going to grab you and they're going to shove you in the hole and they're going to laugh at you. <laughs> you're an idiot and you're going to help you make a fool of yourself. You know, you're going to figure it out. So I figured it out. <laughs> and they didn't know what to think about the results. It, 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 this didn't make any sense. 
But they already had Navalex from Hawaii and everybody in there, and everybody just threw up their hands. They couldn't figure it out because of some stupid numbers on a piece of paper. I realigned the entire system and did a complete analysis on all of it, from the, from the channel level all the way to the, the coaxial cable that disappeared in the South China Sea and popped up in Saigon. So the whole system, I did a complete realignment, all the, all the pilot checks and everything. I went through the whole thing from one end to the other. What was Every system? possible analysis. <clears throat> And the signal to noise ratio was exactly as it was supposed to be, 70 decibels. There was no noise. It was the Air Force test standards and operational procedures did not conform to Bell system practices. All it was is there was a 10 decibel difference in Air Force standards and regular standards. And the Air Force imposed their standards of non-Bell on Bell, a Bell design system and it also could lead to his confusion and nobody would ever believe anything was that simple was this the navy's entire communications this was the entire defense communication system for the pacific south china sea the whole thing i operated i worked right at the central link television by Farnsworth and all that. Everybody was horrified by what happened to their inventions. So Farnsworth, Fowlty Farnsworth, the inventor of television, tell us about it. Yeah, was just completely disgusted with what television turned into by the time he died. He single-handedly invented, invented television. He invented television. Picture of the electronics, the sound, everything. Everything, well, the, that's, you know, the sound's something else, that's just radio. Yeah. But it was getting the image, transmitting the image. They had to do it mechanically with discs, and they just couldn't get a decent TV picture. He figured out how to do it with an electron beam when he was in high school. High school? Yeah, he drew all the diagrams for his chemistry teacher. The guy testified later in court to prove that, that Farnsworth was the inventor of television. He actually did beat RCA. He was one of the only inventors that did. They cried. Their lawyer cried. RCA had never experienced that before. Defeat. Yeah. Never. It's impossible. Farnsworth did it. With time to spare? Television. Yeah, so what they did is then they just blocked television so nobody could make it. Farnsworth, our, our, our Sarnoff could do that. He really blocked it. He just made it so nobody, what he did is to make it so nobody would honor your patents or anything. So, so, and you couldn't build it. You didn't have enough money. No, they just decided, well, no one's going to make your television. And meanwhile, we're going to steal all the ideas that have been thrown. It's about eight years. It's a sort of. We got a fellow Russian, uh, Swartin, to come over to this country and then lie to Farnsworth that he was actually working for Westinghouse and was interested in his electronic scan and then took all the ideas. And then him and RCA, they put a whole million dollar effort into coming up with their own television that could claim to be a different patent and get around Farnsworth. So the Farnsworth ended up with nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So, so, so Zorkin came up with the image uh, orthicon, not image, the uh, image orthicon tube, and it was built on a different principle than the Farnsworth image dissector. So the the, the 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 patent office gave them a patent for it. So now RCA had its own television, and they managed to keep uh, Farnsworth tied up in court and made, and stop things from happening long enough. But they invented their own television, figured out a way around it, because their principles were so damn basic. Hmm. So then that beat Farnsworth. Then he so he never really got anything out of television. But he had another stroke of genius when he invented hot fusion? No, fusion? the uh, image converters, infrared and, and night scope tubes and all that shit for the military after the war. He invented all that. So he was the top guy. The laser sights. He, he had his own department in uh, 
in, in IT&T. He was a division of IT&T, and that's where he started his fusion work, which came out of the television multipactor tubes. They never found any practical, they were never practically developed. Thing, uh, the, all his patents went to IT&T, so they said they owned this fusion, and, uh, and he wasn't going to work on it anymore, and that was the end of that, and he had to leave. So they shut down. Yeah, it wasn't IT&T's intent. IT&T was, of course, the last thing they did to do was lose Farnsworth. Farnsworth made them billions. The so RCA took Farnsworth No, the uh, Wall Street. Wall Street. Yeah. They, they were powerful enough that they said they could uh, they could crash IT&T's stock. That's what they threatened to do. They threatened to crash IT&T's stock through rumors and you know and manipulation, unless they uh, disbanded the the fusion project. See, the people that are against Iran and Farnsworth and all the rest of this stuff is the is the uh, Atomic Energy Commission. They want everything to be uranium and fission. Toxic. Yeah, and all that kind of Well, you know, the, the thing is, is, is they worship that stuff. Yeah, it's a religion. It's a religion. Mm -hmm. It's like a, like a death worship. It's a worship of death. It's what it is. So, why would you find it perfected? Well, it kept burning out after about five minutes. He didn't perfect it. Okay. But he could have. Well, it worked. It worked. He did put out electricity, large quantities of electricity, 100,000 watts for five minutes. How much energy went into creating this? this little, what, what was it inside the tube that made this fusion possible? It was the way that the, uh, the force fields were developed. The tube is empty. He, he can create virtual electrodes. Virtual electrodes? Yeah, so he created a, a concentric uh, shells of virtual anodes and cathodes, and they, you know, all phased everything to where, you know, the intensity would get higher and higher the more and more you got to the center, and then, you know, the little star would appear in the center, and out would come the electricity. Okay. So he created a little star in the center? Yeah, in the center. So you could have we called it a poisson. A poisson. Yeah, it was that's based on a mathematical equation. What Farnsworth found was is uh, normally if you take a, a piece of space, is all the electrons going in is equal to the number of electrons going out. Okay, that's a it's, it's called a, a uh, it's a differential equation type situation. They call it divergence. So everything goes in equals what goes out. So there's no source of electrons in the space. It's empty. So if a million electrons are going into space, a million electrons are going out, and the net electrons are zero. But what Farnsworth found when the star appeared in his multipactor is the amount of electrons leaving the space was greater than those anorins. Where did they come from? That was the big problem. <laughs> So all of a sudden, there's electrons coming from nowhere. So that kind of, you know, created the complication of everybody's way of thinking. So he developed that, you know, to the point where it would also do it with neutrons, so he could get a fusion reaction. So more, more electricity would come out of the space than went into it. Yeah. What's that? Well, he had a name for it. He called it, uh, the physicist called it, some, some guy who did a lot of studying of the electron. I don't know how to pronounce all these Polish names. D-I-R-A-C is how you spell the guy's name. Dirac. Yeah. And they called it the Dirac C. It's this counter space that electrons can come from. Uh, counter space. Yeah, well, they don't, they don't talk about it like that. But that's what it is. It's coming from another space. Farnsworth figured out that's how the sun works. And the, the power comes from another space, not inside the sun, it's from somewhere else. It's channeling from another dimension? Yeah, well, that's the way the physicists like you to talk. How do you like that? You don't use dimensions. So it's either, either the coordinate system or another space or another time or uh, 
but I don't like to call it different dimensions. Okay. That, that confuses the mind. Yeah. So only one dimension is space. You can't say 3D space or 4D space, that doesn't make any sense. There's only one dimension of space, space. Okay. When you think about it like that, then you can have space and you can have counter space, because they're both in the dimensions of space. 3D space and 2D space, and those things are just not for those are coordinate systems, they're mathematical abstractions. You can have any number that you want. It's arbitrary. But they force the whole mind state to think like that. That way you only think in terms of graph paper. You don't think in terms of generalized coordinate systems. And then when you get into this three-phase map, like I've been working on in that book, you see then all of a sudden you have a whole different type of coordinate system. Nine dimensions, according to the physics world. You have nine dimensions in time, which is only one dimension in time, because they're all frequencies of 60 cycles a second. But some turns forward and some turns backwards and some don't turn at all. So you have nine components all together. So algebraically, normally you can't too complicated. You have nine simultaneous equations. It's too complicated. You can't apply it to practical problems. You must like you have to spend all day dealing with you know matrix algebra, which nobody likes. So this guy uh, that came up with that book and that paper. And he figured out a way to, to do it all geometrically. So he didn't need nine dimensions. Reduced it to two. Yeah. Sacred geometry is a comeback dimension. Well, no, but, but there's one, a five-phase system all applies to sacred geometry, but there is no existing five-phase system. Your book does not develop that mathematics, but it's, it gets you started on it. It gives you just enough that you can carry it to other coordinate systems. It you takes a lot of figuring. Have you gotten further? Yeah, I've, I've, I've started. I'm almost about ready to write a paper on the book. But I don't, you know, I see any point in it. <laughs> I'm not really interested in anything anymore anyway, you know. When, when you were... 15 years old in your lab, did you also create or happen, accidentally happen upon the Calipee Farms with the star within a vacuum? Well, that's what Philo thought, you know, when I told him that when we were, you know, playing nuclear meltdown, it was wiping out all the, the radar reception at Hamilton Air Force Base. You were 15. What's that? You were 15. All this stuff happened about the age of 17. Okay. I started building the lab about 15. Okay. It took two years to build it. In your home? Yeah. It's a lot of work. <laughs> then we made from scratch. So the highlight was you actually created a star in a flat. Well, we didn't see that. It was, you know, it was only elements. It was too bright. But you felt the power. Was well, the thing is, is the RF came out of it. That's when Philo, you know, found out that this, when I explained to him, well, he understood that the thing was producing microwaves. And, and uh, you know, in all probability, there was some kind of fusion reaction going on in the tube. And then, he actually, on YouTube, people are doing experiments with just little vacuum tubes with some gas in them, and they're already getting neutron counts out of these things without anything complicated at all. Really? Yeah, just using a simple multipactor geometry. The Koreans have done that. No, I'm seeing people on YouTube, YouTube, they got their radiation detectors, and these things are, are going into runaway neutron, which is the beginning of fusion. That's how you determine, is all of a sudden you get this wild neutron count. You don't want to be standing around that. <laughs> so you have to use a type of hydrogen that has uh, 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 neutrons that don't belong in hydrogen. Hydrogen is not supposed to have neutrons. So you have one neutron, you can have two neutrons, and you can have, I think, three neutrons. So the tritium is the three neutron one, or whatever that is preferred. And then, you know, when Farnsworth got, uh, when ITT gave the jam, they, they also would not supply him with any more heavy hydrogen gas. You do the experiments, yeah. You can't just use regular hydrogen. You have to use hydrogen that's got neutrons on it, which is not natural. It's toxic. 
So if you have water that, you know, that's based on a hydrogen with neutrons in it, it's, it's uh, you know, very unhealthy to drink. It doesn't act like water either. Is that like heavy water? They call it heavy water. Oh. So the Germans were, uh, they were going the, the heavy water route, which would indicate, you know, that their atomic process was going to be fusion and not fission. So their atomic process would be creative and closer rather than explosive. Well, it all explodes. That's the whole thing. It all explodes if you want to use it to make a bomb. But, you know, the, so the, 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 elect, the electron tube end of it is, is not a bomb. It's to make electricity. You don't want the thing to blow up. And it can't blow up. It's self-stabilizing. Uh, it is self-stabilizing. Yeah, self-stabilizing. It'll burn itself out. It won't keep going to uh, run away like that. It'll just short itself out. So it's very safe by nature. Yeah. So, in your, in your opinion, just a little... Uh, more research. More well, Far Farnsworth just couldn't, you know, get the insulation in the tube to hold up. But nowadays, it's well, I don't know. And you know, that's, that's a whole. He had to develop his whole sy his own system of electron optics and mathematics, and, and he was like Tesla. He would have wrote books, that would have helped a lot. Same thing with Farnes, but this stuff's all lost. That's, that's harder to recover than Tesla, because that was very mathematical. A lot of, lot of complicated mathematics involved Farnsworth stuff, or Tesla's stuff is more experimental. You feel that Farnsworth mathematics was... Well, yeah, I mean, I had access initially to all his notebooks. From his family? From Philo, yeah, it was in the house. So. They vanished somewhere. I don't know where. No one can find them. They were hardbound and, and typed up. It was, uh, it was as long as this whole countertop here. Hardbound, uh, uh, typed up notebooks of all of his electron tube research up to the fuser. And they gave you these notebooks? Well, I had free access to them. Why? Why would somebody give you free access well, to them? Well, because, you know, the family adopted me. I lived with those people. Well, and Philo invited me in to get drunk with him, you know, out of the bushes, and he wanted, he wanted to brag. The typical MIT mentality, he wanted to brag. So, you know, we compared sea stories. And then one of mine was too good. It upset him. Which one? The well, one about nuclear meltdown. In your, in your parents' garage. 17. Yeah, and then he got the idea, you know, well, uh, because that related to his father's stuff. So that he was going to one-up me by showing me the tubes that he was absolutely assured I had no idea how they worked. Well, he was assured of wrong. <laughs> just one then, then when I knew there was a star in the tube, before he even said it, then that changed the whole thing. He choked. Yeah, you know, it became a whole different person after that. So, so then I was like adopted into the, the deal. There was no... He couldn't, he couldn't understand, because I was too young to know anything about this. How I could. He kept asking, how old, he kept asking, how old are you? And I looked confused and he said, how old are you? How, how, do you, how would you know about something that was built in the 1930s? Well, the RCA station was built in the 1930s, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, you worked previously. Well, I didn't work, that's where... I always had a place to listen to the music because I was involved, you know, with recording studios and musicians and my friends are all musicians and so I always had a hole with, you know, some contact to the Bach and uh, that's when Philo got me started on the mathematics. So I was, living, yeah, I was living in the bushes next to his house. You were living next yeah. to Philo Fonsworth's Yeah, and house? David used to tell me about him and then I found out that's why David was so smart because Philo was tutoring him at a very young age, and that's why David had an aptitude for all this stuff, as, as you know, a deranged kid that smokes weed in the bushes, abandoned by his parents. Yeah, uh, my buddy David Franklin. We were, you know, like an indivisible team for decades. So he introduced you to Philo, or you just... Well, it, it's, uh, he told me about Philo, and Philo was insane. Because Commonweal had been harassing him to get him off the school board, 
and and he married a a wife that was part of Commonweal, and and they really hounded that guy, and he was an alcoholic, and the whole Farnsworth family was a tragedy because of the disaster that happened to the father, the television, and the whole thing. So this this guy was not father; he was his son. Son, yeah, son. So, 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 Dan, so Philo Farnsworth, they're all named Philo. Oh, the second. Yeah, he's Philo Farnsworth Jr. Okay. Yeah, Philo Taylor Farnsworth the third. He was the third? Yeah, let's call him Junior. He's the third. We just call him Junior. The okay. first Farnsworth has no significance. He's just a, a Mormon pioneer in the okay. Civil War days. The second was the guy who made the television. Yeah. Uh, so the third is his son. son. Okay. So the old man had just died in 72 or whatever. And uh, and I ran across, uh, I was living in the bushes outside Philo's house, and David told me, you know, that the guy you know, says his father invented television and all that, and he's crazy, and it's probably best not to go try to talk to him. <laughs> well, it was an accident, uh, because I was living in the bushes outside his house, uh, one day Philo came out and invited me in. You know, he, he knew that, that I was from RCA and the family hated RCA because RCA, you know, destroyed his father's ability to gain the invention of television and, and, and wiped out Armstrong and did all kinds of horrible stuff to inventors. And here I'm RCA's golden boy, so he didn't know quite how to deal with me. But he invited me inside and he wanted to drink and smoke, you know, and, and I had thought it was destined. That was very welcome. Yeah. So I go in, and the guy said, typical MIT asshole, all he wants to talk about is how much he knows and everything, you know, and I can't get a word in edgewise, but it's the story's interesting. Yeah. So, um, so we were all drunk and stoned, and we started braggarting off to each other. So he told me how he got into MIT when he was 15 years old without his parents or the high school knowing about it. You know, he was proud of the story, and mine was only RCA. I didn't know what to, I had to one-up him. So, so at any rate, I told him about nuclear meltdown in my parents' garage and how it blacked out the radars at Hamilton Air Force Base. And then the guy, like, shut up all of a sudden and started looking at me real funny, and he was all pissed because he couldn't beat the story. So he goes and runs back, and his the whole house is crazy man's house, you know, packed with books and garbage, and you can hardly walk, you know, and the whole thing. And he goes into his hole, pulls out some rotten cardboard box, and it has all these crazy tubes in it that his father made. And he goes, you're so smart, you tell me how these tubes work. So I pull the things out and I look at them. You know, I've never, I've touched every tube in existence. I had it on my bench in my parents' garage. Every tube in existence, from traveling wave tubes to magnetrons to ignatron, I don't care what they were. I had every tube on that bench and I made it operate. I've never seen a tube like any of these. Really? But I'd seen camera tubes and other Farnsworth tubes. So I'm looking at the things and if I start to figure out how they work, Philo doesn't like that. Okay, and then I see one, and the glass was all blackened on the inside from the x-rays. Uh, but the electrodes weren't big enough to substantiate that kind of power flow. And it had been broken off, uh, it was experimental to a neck, and it was broken off, it had no vacuum in it anymore. So I'm looking at this thing, and I go, Philo, what happened in this tube? Uh, and he gets all like weird with me, you know, well, why are you asking this and that? And I go, well, Philo, something took off in this tube, what happened in this tube? He goes, well, how do you know that? I go, well, look at it. Something took off. Yeah, something took off. Tell me, Philo, what took off in the tube? So finally, he backed out of this whole thing, and he told me that his father had created his first star inside that vacuum. And then he laid the whole thing out to me. And the family adopted me at that point. I had free access to all the notebooks or tubes or anything I ever wanted. And Commonweal broke into the house and stole all the original television tubes, but they didn't get the they didn't get the other ones. I think they're packed away in Salt Lake or somewhere. Most of the family's gone now. So he showed you the star to yeah. and you figured it out. And this was the genesis yeah, of the and cosmic that, induction generator. Well, that's what I was doing at the same time. So he invited his mother, the wife of the inventor, to Utah. They came out and they went to our K lab in David's bedroom and they saw the galaxy and the light bulb. And, and that was it. The Farnsworth family adopted me right at that point. You know, here the old man has spent a whole life, you know, custom designing vacuum tubes to get this effect. And here's some crazy kids that smoke dope with a bunch of transformers and stuff hanging on the wall in this bedroom. And we're doing this stuff in burned out street lights out of dumpsters for fun, terrorizing the neighborhood.
the TV interference and the lights flashing on and off in everybody's houses at night. It's like the UFOs were landing. PG, PG knew what was going on. They would have shit all over themselves. You think it's stars and burst it out street lights? Yeah. Lamps? <laughs> oh, that, that, that's too much, man. What are we going to do? Well, that's what the Farnsworth family thought, you know? I mean, they were so high on their horse about all this, and here, you know, is this this crazy Jewish kid and this insane, you know, electronics technician from RCA, the hated RCA, and they're making galaxies in old burned out street lights with some kind of Tesla transformer made out of old RCA parts. Wow. You know, we were doing it because it was fun. Basically, basically what it is is the long wave signals all the way down to the actual ones that you can audibly hear without translation to push around eight or ten kilocycles all go to propagate to the inside of the earth. The, so the, the high frequency short wave signals all utilize the ionosphere. So those signals are, 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 are transmitting inside the ionosphere. In other words, you consider the Earth inside a hollow shell of electricity. See, everything past the ionosphere conducts electricity, all the way to the sun. There is no such thing as empty space. Space is too big and there's too much stuff floating around. It all turns out to be just as good as electrical conductor as anything. Just everything's got to be giant. So an empty vacuum. So then you got the atmosphere. The atmosphere has no conductivity, but the thing's only, you know, 64th of an inch thick if you're thinking about the earth yeah. and then you have the earth and that conducts again so we live inside this earth ionosphere capacitor and that's why all the lightning and everything else all gets cooked up because you got this insulating band and you got the billions of volts of the sun and whatever billions of volts in the earth and everything is all it, it all the flux is stuck in this little band like a capacitor Lightning is, is that flux getting out of control, getting stirred up by storm clouds and stuff, and then all of a sudden you got giant sparks everywhere. Are you saying having more man-made RF in the air is causing more lightning? No, it didn't say anything like that at all. Man-made RF has nothing to do with it. It just bounces around in it. But the point Unless is... Unless you turn it up too high. You know, like they're trying to do with the harp. They're trying to stimulate an artificial aurora. That's the purpose of the project, is to stimulate an artificial aurora. That's why they only fire it up during solar flares. Why? To collect power? Yeah, they, 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 I think they're expecting an energy back wave. How big? Well, I don't know. They don't talk about that stuff. How much it's power? It's an HF device. It operates anywhere between 4 and like 28 megacycles. So it's really a power plant of some kind. That's what's been suggested. It's no weather control. It's no weapon. There's nothing to do with Tesla there at all, even in the most remote form. There's nothing there that has any connection with Tesla whatsoever. Really? Yeah, at all. So it just so collects... So all that stuff that's been written about the harp, other than Jerry Vassilatos' material, is all disinformation to make money. Ah, uh, so no sinister government plot, just no. disinformation. No. Now, China's got, it's got something going right now that I'd be more worried about. It's jamming all the bands. What is it? They have their own harp now. But nobody seems to want to talk about it. It's loud. It's on all the time. It's real pestilent. They have no regard for other services. The harp will not transmit on primary services like aircraft, aviation, and all that type of stuff. The harp, will, the harp deliberately is not on those frequencies. You will not hear the harp on ham radio band because they know there would be an outroar, but, they, but the Chinese don't care. So now the whole uh, telegraph band on 40 meters is jammed out every morning by these giant multi-megawatt, 50 microsecond pulses. Is the China harp stronger it's than the woodpecker. American harp? It's like, the, they're all, like the woodpecker was the first one of these. It had nothing to do with Tesla. It had nothing to do with ELF. It buried him, buried him in itself in this big lies of disinformation false attributions to Tesla. It's nothing to do with that at all.
Nobody really knows what it's for. They figured it was some kind of radar. And it just plagued the entire HF spectrum. They did not care who was for it. Then it went away. That was like Solar Cycle 22. Then Solar Cycle 23, we ended up with the harp. America. Yeah. Now Solar Cycle 24, we got China harp. It's all over the place and on all the time. It's a complete... T-94, T-94 control. What do you think it's for? China. I have no idea. You know, at Landers, I had all the equipment to analyze it. It was a, uh, it's a, it's a, the harp is too. It's a, it's a type of F, a pulsed FM signal. And it occurred in spectral blocks of like 50 kilocycles wide. And it was pulsed in like 50 microsecond pulses, if I remember right. I, I don't, you know, I didn't really write it all down. But it made it so that I couldn't talk to any of the people I normally talk to. They had no business doing that in the amateur radio band. And then it started also jamming out Coast Guard signals. So you think it's an attack, a radio attack? I have no idea. It's just, it's just stuff. If everyone's all worked up about the harp, why aren't they walk talking about that? That's my point. You know, my point is, is all the real stuff that's going on, you don't even hear about. All you hear about is what's not going on. <laughs> So I can pick all that up. That place was like like the FCC. I was on the phone to the FCC and the government all the time. Really? Yeah. Giving them information. Information about sources of interference and, and signals that weren't operating properly. The National Weather Service, uh, the FCC. So you were helping to protect American communications at land. I was the FCC, because none of those agencies are in business anymore. It's just all politics and money. No one's taking care of anything. I was I was hearing all kinds. I was hearing foreign troops operating illegally on radios inside the United States bound borders. Mexican troops. I would get these phantom signals. Uh, you know, some transmitting station uh, didn't wasn't built right, and uh, and their transmitters would intermodulate, and they produce frequencies that they weren't even transmitting. But they weren't on a you, had, you had to have spectrum analyzers in order to find this stuff because the frequencies are so far apart. You had to try to find out which spectral lines were simultaneous. I had spectrum analyzers that covered the whole one megacycle blocks or more of the HF spectrum. This stuff cost like $25,000 a pop. But that's why I can't just up and replace this stuff. You gotta have the antenna field, you gotta have the uh, Highly sophisticated receivers. They all, everything has to operate wide band. There is no tuning in the normal concept. All the oscilloscope displays, and you know, I don't know where. I, I saw one receiver on eBay that had this the spectrum analyzer, three thousand five hundred bucks. That's a steal. But I don't have three thousand five hundred bucks to spend on a receiver. Okay, we're looking at so data from the, Landers um, to Lurk. Antenna station. And, okay, go ahead, Eric. So this is the, the solar activity. Uh, the green is the uh, Earth ionosphere waveguide, uh, the noise level. The red is the uh, underground uh, telluric. Uh, oh, is the uh, the, the um, there's a. No one would understand the names I use for it, but the, base, the signals underneath the ground, the earthquakes, what I call the earthquake signals. And the top is the, uh, the vibration counter at Landers on the seismograph. Okay. So what dates do we have here? I forget what year, like four years ago, whatever the Haiti earthquake was. Okay. See, you can see the, uh, see the months are here. Oh, gotcha. Here. Yep. The, okay. I've got to make sure to put page numbers on these before... And I scroll down. See how when the solar flux goes, these are earthquakes. We, See these vertical lines? Yep. Those are the major earthquakes of the planet. So this was Indonesia, Philippines, British Columbia, Mexico, North Mexico. This thing was something strange. So it must have been underneath the ground at Landers. This one was in Northern Cal. This was Eureka. This was Haiti. 
This was Mexico. This one doesn't have a name. This one doesn't have a name. This one. This one doesn't have a name. This was Sumatra. In Mexico. Salton Sea. Um, this is Mexico too. I did Baja. And then, uh, then it was time, but the logs are lost now, so I can't. Okay. I will go over this. Kind of seeing the correlation of solar flares and earthquake activity. Yeah, I, mean, look, I mean, obviously, you know, peaks and earthquakes. So there's peaks. Another and solar surge and earthquake. Solar surge. See when there's see when there's no solar activity. Yep. No earthquakes. What is the? So see how the Earth's vibrations at landers, how they correspond exactly to the increase in solar activity. And when the sun died down again, the vibration died down. What did the? Just like we had a recent uh, solar increase in solar activity. Yeah. There's been a recent increase in earthquake activity. So what did we find out with the telluric and the antenna system, the above ground and below ground? What did that? So there wasn't enough local earthquake activity to kick up the underground. Okay. So it's just basically you're looking at the the ionosphere. You can see how the ionospheric noise went up here. That's what the Japan. That's how I got the Japan earthquake. See, the ionospheric noise did a thing like this. So that one in Mexico. See, the green one was just for Los Angeles. Okay, so green's Area. underground. The underground. Yeah, and it was only a very narrow range. It was just for the. I, only, I didn't want long range okay. because the green one. If the green one jumped up here, Los Angeles was going to get a 6.5 or greater earthquake. Gotcha. All right. The Earth signals only occur at 6.5 or greater. 6.5 or yeah, earthquake about, magnitude. Yeah, about 6.5 or greater. That's when the ground starts to sing. So with this, the green is the singing. You'd have to hear it. It sings. Okay. But the red is the crackling. Oh. Uh. They had networks to uh, distinguish between the two. The reason for that is, <clears throat> see how they tend to correlate together? Yep. Because the Earth refracts. So this is the... This signal is the antithesis of this, so what you do is you subtract this from this to equalize it out so you know exactly when they start when this one starts to go after subtracted from this, you know there's going to be a big earthquake in the local area. You see what uh, I'm getting at? Yep. Uh, Alex Anderson had a name for that. Called the barrage uh, the barrage uh, system, where you pick up the noise on one antenna and the signal on the other, and then you take the noise antenna signal and you turn it upside down and you put it into the signal you're trying to receive and it cancels out the noise. Very good. The modern Tesla people now are putting it Edison down. They're saying he was just an idiot and a hack, and he just stole discoveries from everyone. What do you have to say to that? Well, uh, Edison, you know, Edison worked in his own ways. So Ed Edison was definitely one of the greats. There's no getting around it. Okay. It's this total level of productivity, however he went about it. The productivity was there. He invented everything. He literally invented everything. And it never stopped. Like what? What's everything? Everything. Well, the, the, the phonograph, the movie projector, uh, the whole, the, almost the whole telegraph technology, you know, which was the digital at the time, was all invented by Edison. So our internet runs now because of Edison. All, the, the whole basic, the first transmission systems, no one had ever built a transmission system. The, the scientists told them that it could never work. Their equations told them that his parallel transmission system would be impossible. Two wires. That you cannot have loads hooked in parallel. They had to be all hooked in series, otherwise you, they, they said that you would lose energy as you went down the line and the light bulbs at the end wouldn't light. It would have to be a, a, a 1 over E curve. Well, it is a 1 over E curve, but not nearly as steep as the, sci the European scientists you know, said it's impossible and impossible, it's, you know, impossible, you, you can't do this. There was no cables or wire or junction boxes or fuses or sockets. He had to invent all that shit, it, the method of getting the stuff into the ground, shielding the cables, uh, uh, designing circuit breakers, uh, figuring out how to make generators, 
and Edison cooked, you know, him and his team, they cooked, you know, he, had, he had a lot of good people working with him. That's how Edison made a lot of things happen. And, and that's a good way to do it. And, and they were all like family. You know, he wasn't ripping anybody off. These people all lived and, and you know, and, and sang and drank together in the same building. Tesla was just a whole different animal. It, and neither of them fared well. They both got burned. Same way. Edison was the first one to lose his company. Really? Yeah. Before Tesla? Yeah, before Westinghouse or any of them. Te Edison was the first one to take the bite. They, they took his company away from him. Then he became embittered and, and swore he'd never work on electricity again, and he got just into a bunch of screwy mining equipment inventions that never worked. Really? That's yeah. how he went down? Yeah. Wow. Lost everything. So he was a true American genius, that's... Well, he, the guy was a, a producer. He was a, just, you, uh, you, you couldn't, you couldn't slow him down. The guy was just like totally productive. He was always building things. Always hands on. Yeah, there's always something happening. Where Tesla was uh, the, the in-depth experimenter, focused experimenter. Edison would play around with anything. Edison was a chemist and a telegraph operator. Started as a chemist. A telegraph operator on the railroad trains as a kid. He became the best telegraph operator in existence. And then he had his chemical laboratory in the caboose where he'd do his experiments. Blew up one day, and that ended uh, his career with the railroad. Where can people find this awesome information about Edison and Tesla? There's a lot of biographies on, on Edison. There's no shortage of those. So Tesla, you know, the uh, prodigal genius is the standard Tesla biography. And then, uh, then there's a book uh, called Empires of Light. Or em Empires of, yeah, Empires of Light. Uh, that's that book is about Ed, uh, Westinghouse, Edison, and Tesla, and the whole electrical industry they created and how they all got jammed. That's a good one. That connects all the, all the guys together. So when they tell us Edison and the light bulb. Is that really his greatest achievement? Well, the movie projector wasn't too bad either. You know, movies are still around, really. But digital now, but you know, you still see, you know, that's still not gone. He invented that, he what? invented the movie, the movie theater. 1890s? Edison invented it, 1890s. I don't remember, but yeah, he invented it you know, probably more in the 1900s. He invented the movie theater, <laughs> he invented the phonograph record. What did he do with the light bulb exactly? Did he improve it or create it from scratch? No, he made he made the first stable light bulb. How were they not stable before? They just burn out. How fast? Hours. Ah. Yeah. Okay. And they weren't particularly bright. And these real expensive materials like platinum. Ah, so he reduced the price and increased the longevity of the light bulb. Yeah, and, and he raised the impedance. So they operated on low current and high voltage. So he came with a device that worked on the low current and high voltage, which was important. Why? Uh, then you don't need big wires. Uh, how big were those wires? Well, we're talking about a 10 to 1 reduction in the size of the wire with an Edison lamp compared to a regular piece of hot metal. So how big would the wire be in the street going to your home? Well, normally anything that gets bigger around in your arm starts to you have to start paralleling them up. <laughs> So his voltage is only 100 volts, so the wire made the wires big. But most of the light bulbs only work on three volts, and then the wires would be as big around as my car. That would just be completely impractical. <laughs> and electromotive force will only move, uh, will only go a volt a foot or foot a volt. So if, if you have 10 volts, you can only go 10 feet. Volts, 10 feet. Yeah, if you go 100 volts, you can go 100 feet, and 1,000 volts, 1,000 feet. So so 100 volts really wasn't good for going very far than just like one block in a city. So as soon as you got more feet than volts, then all of a sudden you got to start doubling up on the copper. Uh, That's the problem. 
So the farther you go, then the, even though the current's the same, the, the, the distance determines the diameter of the wire. Then they have to be insulated and shielded. There wasn't any of that technology. Edison had to come up with the coaxial cable and uh, the, the, the protective devices, the circuit breakers.